I should fix my. Hello and welcome to yet another super prepared episode of Lore Beards. We're one hundred percent ready at this end. Woo! Hi everyone. As always, if there's any issues with our sound, well, at least my sound, since I'm the only one bellowing down into your ears at the moment, do please tell us, and we'll do a little bit of an adjustment at this side. But assuming that everything is all right, massive welcome to you all out there today. We are going to be diving deep into the horrific enormous awfulness that is the more and it's counter say counter what we're going to call the other side the maelstrom <laughs> the, the, yeah let's call it the maelstrom of skulls let's give it its proper name rather than the maw's butthole yeah so <laughs> i mean you could argue that both sides are buttholes or both sides around there's no <laughs> there's no right or wrong answer it's just a there matter is of, indeed no right or wrong just answer. a matter of perspective <laughs> All right, so uh, today we've got lots of different ways that we can start this one. Have you got a preferred start starting point? Uh, I think probably the best place to start would probably be to start with the the Ma side, just because it's it's more well known, uh, and we've we kind of touched on it in some prior episodes with well, like Grand Cathay and things like that. Um, I so I think noting that when we get to the other side i'm going to be saying something relatively not very but relatively controversial in that i'm going to say total war has it wrong <laughs> Woo! Uh, that, if 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 get if, him <laughs> yeah if you're if you're going to be saying what i what i think you're going to be saying um uh, i don't i don't think i'll necessarily disagree but yeah We'll I, find out my, when we get my there. My thing is that it's they had to put it somewhere. <laughs> and it is exactly that point. And yeah. I think that there's a good way of justifying it as well. But we'll get to there when we get to there. So if we're going to be starting with, I suppose, the Maw side, we're going to be doing what we normally do when we say, we're going back in time. <laughs> no, no, we don't. We can't. <laughs> we don't have any transitions here. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's just me sort of saying we're going back in time. Now, I, in fact, let's go with for a slightly different version of it. Normally, we start off by going back in time to the actual date inside the Warhammer world when a thing occurs. But instead, why don't we go for the date when it occurred with Games Workshop? So, in White Dwarf number 300, you got yourself a free map of the Warhammer world. And on that free map, they marked the Great Maw right beside Grand Cathay and the Mountains of Morn. And it was a relatively new thing, heralding what was going to be released the very next month at the start of the new year in 2005. Because in 2005, the sixth edition of the Ogre Kingdom's army list was released. And in that, we didn't just get the description of the Great Maw, we got a big deep dive right down into the Great Maw and exactly what it was. I'm going to be returning to this map later though because when we do the flip side and we discuss the Maelstrom of Skulls on the other side, we are going to be, well, we're going to almost certainly have a discussion as to exactly where it should be. Yes, which is actually a more, they, they did something kind of cheeky uh, revolving around that, but we'll get to that when we get to that. Which, um, given that it could be the butt end of the world, is an appropriate choice of words. <laughs> it's a bit cheeky. <laughs> so, Andy, the... what, did you did you have something this morning? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's been a long week at my side. Trust me, <laughs> I've had a change of medication at my side. So. I'm a going <laughs> right. So, ah, uh, the Great Maw was introduced in 2005 to Warhammer lore as a whole. Now, ogres had been in Warhammer lore, including one of the most famous ogres that any of you that, uh, well, follow the Ogre Kingdoms and its various characters will know already. Good old Scrag the Slaughterer, because he'd been kicking around all the way back since I don't know, must be about White Dwarf. We're looking at the 80s. I'm thinking 90s, really? 80s. Yeah, Scrat the Slaughter is an ancient character. Um, we'll discuss him later because he's uh, the prophet of the Maw, and I think that that's something that's definitely worth having a little side discussion about to a degree. But that character has undergone an enormous amount of change. But the Ogres, to begin with, got completely rewritten, um, as Games Workshop had used them at least, when they got re-released as an actual army list for Warhammer 6th edition. And a part of that rewriting was their culture, and their religion in particular. 
And one of the things that had always been an in joke regarding ogres was that they referred to pretty much everyone else as slim. Hur, 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 hur. <laughs> this had been pretty much an established part of ogre lore almost since they first hit White Dwarf back in the day. And they had always been those big, hungry fellows that were chomping down on something. Now, many of the miniatures contradicted this in that they looked relatively almost well-dressed in comparison to some of the more, let's say, monstrous ogres. And they combined all of these various strands of lore together to create what became the new ogre kingdoms. And in there, there was an enormous discussion, a, a, not just a side, a good page or so, regarding exactly what the mall was and what it meant to the ogres. And to discuss its uh, formation and where it originally came from, we almost certainly want to dive deep into at least a little degree, Gang Cathay, and its relationship with the early tribes of ogres. I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, so <clears throat> we've talked about this quite a bit uh, on uh, some prior episodes, so I'm going to more summarize it, and like, if you want to go really deep into it from the Cathay side of things, you can go check those out. But something, the, the, the long story short is that the ogres used to be very close allies with Grand Cathay. Like, there's even some notes that when... The demons of chaos, like the great catastrophe happened and the demons came pouring into the world. The ogres actually shored up alongside Grand Cathay and helped fight back against the demons. So, you know, there you had your excellent mental imagery of large Cathayan legions with all the dragon children and the celestial dragon emperor and the moon empress. And there was also these giant hordes of ogres running around alongside them, um, which I've always imagined that demons are probably very upsetting for ogres to fight because they don't tend to leave much material behind <laughs> when they die. But... Who knows? Maybe they had an agreement that the ogres could eat all the dead people from both sides <laughs> to clean up afterwards. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, it's like when your dog grabs what you accidentally let fall off the table. It's 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 a working relationship. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> the, uh, the thing that is something happens between these two. We don't know exactly what it is. It's never said. They're the only theory they kind of the little nugget they throw us is that supposedly the ogres uh, who lived in a land that was designed for them, much like the elves lived in Ulthuan, the dwarves lived in the mountains. Supposedly the ogres lived in like this fertile grassland that had all these big beasts and all this other stuff that allowed them to um, kind of have a paradise. And ogres compared to pretty much every race almost seem to populate very, very quickly. Um, they're almost like halflings it seems like, and that they can have kids, a lot of kids, very quick, even faster than humans. Um, and what this, supposedly, this led to the ogres starting to basically overpopulate their area. And they started migrating into Cathay, and some of them started eating Cathayans. Uh, I'll add an extra detail here, because there's a couple of small extra seeds that are also mentioned. Mm. And that's that the original ogre populations were extremely, let's say, basic. They didn't have anything in regards to technology. They are, were living in what they considered a paradise, but almost everyone else would consider to be a monster-filled hellhole. Um, <laughs> and their numbers, in many respects, were held in check by their, their surroundings. The very fact that these open, grassy plains, which were just paradise to them, were filled with all manner of enormous creatures. And the entire area was dangerous. However, the Cathayans provided them with some basic tech, and as simple as fire. Some mm. very simple first steps forward. And the one thing that ogres can do and becomes very much a core part of their culture and a part of their psyche is that they can adapt quickly and merge in very quickly with almost anything. They fit in really well. And just these small <clears throat> incremental changes meant that they moved from being a species that was in relative balance with its environment to completely dominating it as they yeah. wiped out almost everything around it with relative ease and not only turned potentially on themselves, but started looking outwards. Yeah. And you know, I, th I think an apt example that's kind of interesting is that uh, for those who are aware of uh, like for those that are like more 40k fans and are aware of kind of 40k orcs and the whole thing of like they're constantly looting and taking stuff and readapting it, that actually has a lot more in common with fantasy ogres than with fantasy greenskins. Um, yeah. There are some fantasy greenskins that do that, but they're actually far rarer. But ogres are all about that business. Like they are it constantly taking stuff and adapting it for themselves with disturbing skill. 
Um, yeah, they're like, really good at not it. stupid. <laughs> they are to a degree that this has been balanced out as you move over into Age of Sigma as well, because the ogre deity over there is effectively Gorka Morka anyway. So mm -hmm. um, they've all been wrapped together to a degree as you move towards their future manifestations. But back here in good old olden times, back when the world was hoary and old, <laughs> um, they're very much their own Sorry. species. <laughs> um, it's a good word. <laughs> it's old, dearie me. Um, <laughs> So, pushing that aside before I lose my thread entirely, um, our ogres are in a position where they're now dominating the land around them and they're doing it rapaciously. They're moving at a significant pace and where beforehand they were previous allies of the Cathayans, they were now spreading out far too fast and their numbers were high and as it turns out, probably too high. In yeah. that, they were <clears throat> coming in such numbers that the Cathayans weren't just concerned, they were in trouble. Yeah, I, 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 even though I struggle to connect the dots to it, I still have my personal very strong fan theory that they either were blamed for the death of one of the dragon kids or something happened. And uh, eventually Celestial Dragon Emperor gets his little conclave of astromancers, his court of astromancers, and tells them, deal with it. <laughs> and they deal with it the way Heaven's Wizards deal with problems, which is they throw a meteor at it every single this time. Proper mental. Um, now, when you look back at all of the original sources for this one, you'll find that almost every single one of them says, nobody's quite sure what happened, which is their way of saying, we've created a tale and we're not quite sure if it makes sense. But cut a long story short, it seems that the Cathayans probably pulled down a giant chunk of what turned out to be warp stone. Probably. Yeah, and what's, what's and I say this with a certain amount of caginess because all of the details around this even when different authors have, atta have tackled it have always been left uh, a bit uncertain but here or there they're not just clues there's very clear this was warp stone and there's a very clear another one elsewhere saying the Cathayans did it so it probably was them yeah and what i what, uh, what's a really interesting thing as well is we do have some descriptions of what the ogres saw from their perspective because it didn't it didn't just come down in a day it took a while for the, the comet to arrive, and the yeah. ogres saw it, it like months, months before it eventually yeah, hit. They like they literally saw this tiny little green gleam up in the sky, and it started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And there are notes that from the ogres not only noticed it, but they started. It started kind of unnerving. I don't think is the right word because I don't think the ogres were afraid of it because they they were very interested by it. Of that, what they saw when it got big enough was that they literally saw what they perceived to be like a living entity in the sky because it had green fire kind of around it. And like, I can't, I'm trying to remember, I think from their perspective, it looked like it was like a mouth that was opening and closing, like as it was coming towards them. And they were like, yeah, oh, that's uh, weird. That, yeah, that that's the thing. Got to remember, uh, uh, as I say, got to remember, we haven't discussed this yet, but the ogre psyche is simple. Um, and one thing, whether it's before or after the arrival of the Maw, one thing sits through to the very heart of what ogres are, and that's the bigger it is, the better it is. And as this thing swelled in the sky and got bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually it eclipsed completely the light of Morsleib and Mansleib and made the moons look like nothing. And it then eventually... Yeah. It could be seen during the day as it got closer and closer and then eclipsed the sun itself as far as the ogres were concerned. Until eventually, after all of those weeks passed, it came pounding down towards the very center of their plane, their great, green, gorgeous land. And it didn't just obliterate everything. It completely and utterly wiped it out. But it's worth putting an extra detail here. It didn't have a normal explosion. Now, normally, if a massive impact... Oh, I didn't see that. I've got something in the way of my comments. Thanks for bringing that up. Hammond. <laughs> <laughs> Who lives in a pineapple under the maelstrom? First mate, half... <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I'm not going to say it. I'm I'm not, not, no, no. I'm not, I'm not going to do it either. <laughs> Today, I'm not doing it. So, uh, thanks, Hammond. As I'm always, not going to copyright strike it. Striked. <laughs> <laughs> for the maelstrom. Um, right, so um, it hit, but if we had had an impact the size of the, let's say, let's call it simply a meteorite to begin with. If, if an, a meteorite the size that would be required to create the maw struck the world, 
it would have been, broadly speaking, the end of most life on the planet. But that didn't happen. <clears throat> and that, if anything, makes it a stronger case that this was most certainly a spell with curtailed effect. It was designed to do a particular thing, but it potentially disastrously went wrong as well. It should have wiped out most of the planet in terms of life. It did not. It wiped out all of the ogres. Almost, but not entirely, to an ogre. Yeah, so a um, couple of interesting little tidbits is that I, I agree with Andy very much that you can... It, it pretty much, I think, solidly suggests that a spell was involved and the Cathayans were probably behind it and mm -hmm. that logically it should have been like literally like dinosaur extinction tier event for everybody on the planet uh <laughs> my god thanks on this night <laughs> Thank, uh, thanks <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> <laughs> just throw just throw the lawyers in just just push them in he'll be fine but um best thing to do with them um <clears throat> so the spell very likely the Cathayans restricted how the spell could interact once it struck the planet of making sure that the blast radius would not go into Cathay itself, which it didn't like it very specifically. It incinerated the ogre homelands and turned it into the warpstone desert, uh, which we all know is awful. And it, it was quite, it was quite literally a nuke, but like way worse because way it not only, worse. not only incinerated everything, but it irradiated everything with warpstone, mm -hmm. which warpstone has a very dramatic effect in that, the initial blast radius killed everything. However, a lot of things that were kind of on just the outer radius were not killed, but instead changed yeah. to the extent that uh, the modern Great Maw, uh, unlike a nuke that goes off and it uh, the, the radiation kind of depletes over time um, and it'll eventually kind of fade away, the Maw is eternally irradiated. And yeah. the, the Warpstone Desert is full of nightmarish things um, I don't think it's really appropriate to call them creatures. I don't think it's appropriate to call them uh, like they're they're often referred to as desert demons or seriously demons. Have it. <laughs> we have our we have our own I'm the lawyer. Oh man, <laughs> it's too bad you didn't go into law. That would have been an easy easy slam dunk for a business <laughs> name. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, so there are there are things that live in the Warpstone Desert, and they are so heavily. Um, altered by Warpstone that they were probably actual flesh and blood creatures at some point, but nowadays they are like, you know it's bad when there's quite literally endless Warpstone to be had and the Skaven are terrified. Like, yeah. they are very, very nervous about going into the Warpstone desert. Um, to, mm -hmm. Like, they want to get all that Warpstone, but it's just, it's just that dangerous. I'll also add as well that you might think that this would completely, definitely, permanently fuck with the ogres as a species, but they have one significant advantage here, which I think is worth just gently t touching upon at least before we move on. Mm -hmm. And that's that ogres, contrary to many people's expectation, are actually extremely resistant to chaos. Um, they're a little bit like the halflings, which many presume are one of their cousin species. The elves often think, and some elven scholars claim that they both come from the same old one stock so to speak um but they're resistant to chaos now that doesn't mean they're immune you do get chaos ogres you also get a bunch of ogres that devolved big time and became something almost entirely different ogres without bellies horrible looking creatures um hey alexander hall thanks for dropping by could this work for me to have a, oh, go for it oh, oh, nope you go ahead you started. <laughs> okay, well, okay. Have any connection to another nearby warpstone deposit beneath Nakashazar? Are their sizes comparable? No, they're not. Um, uh, but they could be related. In fact, I'm going to add one extra little detail so I don't forget it because it's an easy one. There is a possibility that it was neither the Cathayans' intent and the spell was done by the Cathayans. So there's, for example, the theory that's put forward by the Lord Master of Sotek hey so tech who suggests that there must have been something that caused them to do it but there is a slightly more obvious slightly less determined version which could be something more along the lines of we know that morslieb got chucked out oh i'm never going to get these points out hey sam instead of just worst of meteorite i've always said kind of as a uh, warfast will play as a be pulled from space we will, we will get to the space entity theory We'll, we'll get there. Yeah, we'll definitely get there. So, 
We know that Morsleib is a massive chunk of warpstone that got ejected from the Northern Pole during the Cataclysm. We know this. Yep. We also know that warpstone in general was created, at least large parts yeah, of it. Yeah, rained down all over the planet. It was and bad. lots of it went up into space. What Morsleib was not the only piece. Morsleib, if you went up to it, probably would be uh, almost a cloud of pieces, not just one single piece. Some of them orbiting around, others attached or whatever. So here's another alternative. Another piece of warp stone, you don't need to say it was thrown by anyone or it came from anywhere, was already going to hit at some point, and it was coming down. The Astromancers predicted it was going to hit them. Now, we're looking at, in times of the time here, 5,250 5, years, I think, before the modern times when the Warhammer world blows up. So it's about then, I think it's minus 2,750, around about there, some, yeah, when, it, like when it hits. So the Astromancers spot it, see it coming, and they're like, it's going to hit us. It's going to hit us. They go to the Emperor and they say, it's going to hit us. And the Emperor says, well, let's use it. Yeah. And, okay, it's a nice, simple way of coming up with a, a way of having the Cathayans both doing it and also doing something which is enormously foolish. And um, they realized the world was pretty much doomed unless they controlled it. So you could say that the Cathayans saved the world from this incoming meteorite of warpstone hell. And at the same point also got get rid of one of their problems which was the growing ogre problem <clears throat> yeah because basically uh, especially kind of the modern uh interpretations that we're getting from the new cathayan stuff in total war warhammer 3 there's definitely the very very strong suggestion that the cathayans did not intend for the great maw to happen they mm. they they were fine with the meteor impact they were not fine with the new god that showed up on their doorstep uh, Godzilla, unlike the myth of the real world, the Mongolian death worm probably exists in the Warpstone Desert, but is the size of a giant. Uh, well, yeah, the, we, we there are definitely death worms in Warhammer Fantasy. Like if you if yeah you could, there they yeah there are absolutely hundred percent. But um, what's what's interesting is that like Andy said, that is something went wrong, and I think mm -hmm. Andy's theory has a lot of credence to it, and that there might have already been something coming towards them, and they were just like. We've got to deal with it anyway. We might as well use it to deal with our ogre problem. Because um, the only other theory really is that they grabbed something, but they didn't realize what they were grabbing until it was too late. Um, yeah, and to me, that always strikes me as a bit of uh, a shame, given the almost overwhelming, almost close to, om om not so much om omnipresence, but close to it, that these entities are dealing with. We're dealing with uh, one of the dragons that came from the freaking moon itself. The, the idea hmm. of celestial entities and the celestial objects um, being something that they would make an enormous mistake about, to me, strikes as a mischaracterization for the Cathayans. They are awesome. So I, yeah, to me, I, it's actually more really, likely that yeah, actually it was really less, like you know, it's, it's, it's that they can see it coming and they've probably tried to avoid it. They may even have held it off because it's been almost 5,000 years that it's been up there um, mm. and it's coming down and there's nothing they can do about it. What do they do? They set their astromancers to bring it into a place where they can control it. And it's got to be close because if it's far away, they're not going to be able to stop it doing what would effectively be an impact that would wipe out the world. So it's got to be really close so that their wizards can control it. So I could imagine them coming up to the borders of Grand Cathay and controlling the fuckers that comes down and then shielding, effectively, the world from the worst of what this meteorite's going to uh, do. Yeah, and uh, Vault Boy, I, I would still feel confident that Zinch is kind of ultimately behind it uh, as far as, like, either he tipped it so that it starts heading towards Cathay, because or... You know, I, I like that a lot. I yeah. like that a lot. We are looking at, effectively, um, the great architect here. So the great architect, out of anyone, is the a, the entity that you would say would be most certainly looking at ways of trying to destroy the world. So I very much see the creation of them all, not necessarily as the great architect's plan, but most certainly as the outcome of something that the great architect potentially set off. I think that's very uh, fair. Viberwolf, thank you so much for the super chat. What the sky you rock. So, okay. Y'all are y'all are hammering in super chats. We appreciate it, but we're kind of like struggling to keep up for a second. So uh, I'm gonna summarize it very, very quick so we can kind of get caught up to what we're doing. Of uh the Go. sky titans, unfortunately for them, they didn't really get much time to react. Um, because they're gonna deal with another issue, uh, which we're gonna get to right now, which is that so the the great maw comes down. Well, something, a warpstone comet hits it's the definitely planet. it's definitely laced with warpstone. Let's be yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely. And it, yeah. It, 
incinerates or devours in a sense two-thirds of the ogres ogre race like yep. two-thirds of the ogres of which there were easily hundreds of thousands were just ex just gone in an instant um and this is a moment we have to kind of focus on for a second because it's so critical to what happens next which is that there is a theory posited in the in the ogre kingdom's own mythology that they believe that because this impact killed so many ogres at once, they don't see it as, oh, well, there was the shock wave and the fire blast and everything that incinerated all the ogres. What they saw in their interpretation of the event was a single large creature came down and took one bite out of their entire race and ate two thirds of them in a single bite. But interestingly, note, didn't eat them all. And this becomes a part of their cultural mores, how they work, and, and that they see consumption as a method of showing power over something else. But they don't necessarily always eat all of what comes out before them. Sometimes if they win, for example, a duel, um, they'll take an arm and say, well done. I take you unless they go guts out, take their belly plates off, and then it's to the death. But yes, it's very mm -hmm. much part of what informs later ogre culture. Um, yeah. So and, let's go on to our Sky Titans so that we can bring up. Just cool answer point. it in case we don't get back to it. They, they yeah, yeah they, they barely had time to react. I'm sure the Sky yeah. Titans, with how advanced they were, especially up in the ancient giant lands, I'm sure they saw it coming. And who knows? They might have had their own involvement in containing the blast so that the blast did mm. not go westward. And, and um, it could have been um, part of the issues that eventually brings down the species as a whole as well. There's all manner of stuff that you could throw at it. Yeah. Um, Cole, thanks uh, very much. Cole, you rock. Personally, I prefer the irony of the arrogance of a god hater accidentally making a god rather than it being forced upon the dragon emperor. Yeah, well, I think that we can still maintain that central irony um, in that they attempted, if we go with this theory, they attempt to control this incoming thing, they attempt to make it something that works for them, and they create a god in the process. Yeah, that was never their intent. Yeah, because with Andy's theory, there's still the idea that they could have redirected it to where nobody was. They could have tried and just shunted into the chaos waste or a part of the ocean or somewhere where a civilization that they're aware of would not have been hurt and they, you know, contained the damage. But it, the arrogance could be that they tried to use it as a weapon mm -hmm. um, when they should have just contained it as best they could. I, I will say, though, this is not just a theory. It's about as theory, theory, theory as you can get. Theory time. Um, it very much is a theory. But it is worth saying that what we can say is that the dragon emperor was involved if we go with the most recent versions of the lore that's on it and that dragon emperor probably would have done whatever they it could to use it against the ogres we don't know that they could have moved it it's very possible it was always going to hit there and all they did was curtail the extent of the explosion but if you want to have some cathayan guilt in this you really do want to have the idea that they steered it a bit and if you're trying to build an interesting story filled with those ironies as we were just suggesting earlier you would really want to give the idea that it was their decision to put it there and they done fucked up uh, <laughs> on this side, now I'm wondering if ogres would consider cannabis a sacred herb. Really um, like, like, no. Be a no. Um, I can actually say for categorically no, because it would have no effect on them. Um, their stomachs are unlike human stomachs, are indeed unlike any species in our world, the real world <laughs> stomachs. It would do nothing. They might have some equivalent that would give them extra hunger pangs, but I don't think we'd ever want any ogre to have that because they're already hungry enough. Yeah, and but this leads into an interesting point, which is so talking about when the Great Maw impacted you, the, one the, one of the ogres, one of the things that happened in this moment that was pivotal is... In that moment that the Great Maw, or what would become the Great Maw, hit the planet and killed two-thirds of the ogres, it immediately established a connection with the ogres. And it, it went two ways, where the ogres reflected onto it, and it reflected back onto them. Yeah. Because the ogres fundamentally change after this yeah. moment. Yeah. In they, that, they become a new species, almost. Yeah. And that, for the ogres, um, the, the Maw was... From what we know, they interpreted it as a large entity that had a mouth and was devouring everything, but that is likely a lot of the ogres projecting their own beliefs onto it, which I'll get into how that ties in in just a second. But mm. when it hit the planet and they really 
deeply believe that this was just a giant creature and two thirds of them die. That is yeah. hundreds of thousands of souls going into the ether in an instant, mm -hmm. which has, we've talked about on prior episodes, how profound the mortal realms reflect onto the ether and back. And warp stone is literally a physical nugget of like the bridge between these two. Yeah, I mean, it's very possible that the, in fact, it's almost certain that reality itself to a degree was shattered here. Now, I mean, reality as in the mortal realms, the physical realm in which all of the various souls in the Warhammer world have got their corporeal reflections. You've got the Aether on one side and the mortal realms on the other side, the realm of the gods and the realm of mortals, if you wish. Um, and this split um, was br almost certainly broken down here, as we'll discuss when we discuss what the Maw actually is, um, which means that all of those hundreds of thousands, you could argue, maybe even formed the Maw as they mutated and twisted and became something quite new. It's quite possible that this ancient entity that 5,000 years later is still gobbling away in some fa weird fashion is composed of nothing but ogre flesh. Uh, that's one way of interpreting what eventually it becomes. All we've got for certain is that the ogres are wiped out and it leaves behind something that within a year will be discovered and is actually massive, real, and already fully established within a single year. And it is the Maw as we know, thousands of years later, and it hasn't changed in any realistic fashion in all of that time. So this isn't something that was simply shaped by the thoughts of others over time. This is something that almost instantly came into place. That being the case, it's very difficult to ascribe to it the standard Warhammer. Oh, we all believe it's real, so it's sort of come into place. Instead, this is something that has been fundamentally created on the spot, almost certainly by the ogres. Uh, let's bring up Viper there. Oh my God, people, they are literally outpacing us, Andy. <laughs> yeah, they are, aren't <laughs> like they? Can you mess with as well? We appreciate the support. Thank you very much. Um, but like, good Lord. Rock, we will get to this um, because, uh, I mean, it's not really the yeah. boss child. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 will get to, we will get to the, the fire mouth. Um, um, there's, I'm about to talk about something that will tie into the fire mouth. The fire mouth is not going to so get touched We on a will lot. get back to this. Don't worry. Um, yeah. As we then move over to Gree, the writer, thanks for dropping by, Gree. You rock. What further reinforces the argument that the comet is an eldritch entity manipulated by Zinch is because Zinch is very much the cosmic horror kind of chaos god. So both being cosmic horror-ish makes perfect sense. It does, but I would also add that um, just to make a counter argument that when we move towards Age of Sigmar, um, it's very much laid more on the Gorka Morka side of things rather than the Zinch side of things in terms of what the Maw then eventually develops into. Um, yeah, so it's, I would... it's difficult to necessarily say that's the case, but I think there is a really fun argument that can be built for that. Yeah, I, I would say the Maw definitely falls more under Chaos Undivided as opposed, if, like, if you want to look at it from that lens. I don't think it's a Chaos Entity. Um, because, I don't think so either because um, Zinch it, is it, it, it's a chaos. Physical, yeah, it's a physical the maw, thing. The Maw is the ogre god and the ogres are not chaos. They're bluntly not chaos. They are absolutely not chaos. You wouldn't say orc and goblins <laughs> are chaos. They're most certainly destructive, but they're not that destructive. You can ally with them. You can work with them. The ogres and the Maw in general are not chaos gods per se. Hey, on the yeah. side. Thank you. I, I'm not going to read it out. Just thanks. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's a you problem um but uh uh so the the other thing that uh with the maw's impact is that we've talked about how the ogres likely their death changed the maw into what it is you know from yeah. potentially just just a regular warpstone meteor to something far more profound and hideous but it also reflected immediately in that moment back onto the ogres that survived is the maw oh, <laughs> Get out in heaven. <laughs> There's the door. Get out. But uh, uh, do continue on. <laughs> but the um the maw also reflected onto the ogres in that they're they have this profound, deep understanding that this is an entity that if it can eat two-thirds of their race in a single bite, truly must be insatiable. It must be the ultimate predator an entity that could never be satisfied because how could something that is with such a large mouth that could devour so much ever be full. And they come to the conclusion that simply it cannot. And, huh. and oh, it's, it's going to get bad. <laughs> yeah. And that reflects back onto them. 
where the um, maw fundamentally changes the ogres to where they can never feel true. Well, it takes a lot for an ogre to feel satiated, to feel full, and it lasts fleetingly, yeah. very fleetingly. Like so, it really gives them an endless hunger and more than just a physical sense. Um, this yeah. also is where the ogre's wanderlust comes from. Like mm -hmm. they drew like mentally, emotionally, physically, they are given an endless hunger. Yeah. Um, I'd also add that um when the meteorite strikes and the great blast happens and everything is vitrified for an enormous area uh, that becomes a hellhole. It's absolutely awful for hundreds of miles around. Truly bad apocalyptic stuff. The ogres that survive on the periphery, and you could say a happy third are happy. They're not. A very small number on the, on the periphery are still largely what they may have been before. The vast majority of them are deeply changed. Not just because this place becomes a hellscape that they've now got to fight through with nothing left to eat, with nothing left to really do anything with they turn in each other they turn into blood so frenzies as they do so they become a completely different in terms of the psychology species and this sticks and this blood frenzy lasts for quite some time and you could say that we go through a period of survival of the fittest um and survival of the fattest yeah and it one of the things that's really interesting is that it seems that the ogres that lived in kind of like the lowlands or the foothills of the mountains were the ones that survived because none of the ogres to the east survived all the ogres that were in the God. west survived and it's and i think that also speaks to the Cathayans being involved yeah and those ogres the third of the population it lit it's a madhouse like mm. a lot of them go crazy because of yep. this sudden change um but those that kind of the tribes that kind of managed to band together start heading up into the ancient giant lands because there's nothing to eat Mm -hmm. um they're gonna starve and yep. they 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 there's nothing left for them and as as bad as the great maw is and everything around it nowadays that was when it was at its worst because it had like kicked up all this warp stone dust into the atmosphere and there were like firestorms that could strip flesh from bone just going all over the place and if you like if even the ogres with their resistance to chaos if they hung around too long they would just start mutating horribly and would yeah. just like turn into a chaos spawn and die. But not all of them, because ogres resistant to chaos. And one in particular decides that he's going to do the thing that none of the other <laughs> ogres think is a good idea. Yeah. So we're talking very short length of time here. Now, we're not talking big time scales. We're talking within months. Groth one finger as he eventually gets called because yep. his face is melted. He is melted. There's very little of him left. Only a single finger out of all of his 10 digits survives. He is a broken figure, but his eyes still work and so do his legs. And he decides to lead his tribe directly to what he thinks is responsible for it all. He feels that this is something that he must see. In the same way that they've got this great hunger that becomes a part of their character growth one eye is the very first one to get that great hunger to see them all and this is a hunger that will later on become a core part of all ogres all mm. ogres will always have this desire to at one point make a pilgrimage to the mall and stare right down into that dark abyss that lays down beneath and many will become sacrifices to the mall <laughs> when they make their way there so yeah. growth hikes it towards that horrendous mess that has just become the Maw. Yeah, he leads the Lazark tribe, uh, and he leads them all the way to the Maw when it was at its absolute worst. <laughs> not the first, just the first to come back. You know what? You're not I wrong. Think You're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good point. Um, but, although I think it's fair to say a good hundred miles or so worth of ogres were all dead anyway, so they didn't really yeah. have much choice. <laughs> yeah, so um, what's interesting about Groth is that he, he felt the call. Like he mm -hmm. felt something deep in his soul. And that's something that's very interesting and unique about the great Maw compared to almost any other God in Warhammer fantasy in that he is so it is so imprinted on the ogres that it physically calls to them. And mm -hmm. at least once in their life, they must go home. They must go and see them all. They, they can't help it that like they have to, it's, it's like a deeply unsettling, 
it's like an itch they can't scratch or a hunger yeah. they can't satiate. It's like a hunger of knowing, of seeing, witnessing this thing. And in some respects, this is one of the reasons that the ogres, contrary to many people's expectations, make exceedingly poor slaves. Now, slavery is never a good subject to be discussing, but dark elves take slaves. Skaven takes slaves. Many species in the Warhammer world do take slaves. The Dark Elves realized this fast. Dark Elves are clever, and they decided instead to hire them. They, mm. the, the ogres are one of the few species that they purposely avoid enslaving because it turns into rebellion. It because went at bad. Some point, <laughs> it went at some bad. point, their guts go, and they have to go, and nothing will stop them. When that itch comes, they'll go, and if they're being stopped, the other ogres start getting antsy, and they still go as well. So the Dark Elves very quickly realized this was an issue. Skaven much less so. They're pretty stupid. They constantly make the same errors again and again, but they ended up breeding their own version of ogres because of this, which is eventually where the birth of the rat ogres come from. Yep. Uh, so, uh, hey, on the side. Yeah, I think there's a lot to that of, is it because it's so imprinted on them or because it literally physically exists in the world that's very, very unique? I would say that the relationship is far more powerful because it's a physical entity. Um, yes. It doesn't have to do a lot of the hoop jumping and other... The Great Maw, like, we'll kind of get into how it thinks, quote-unquote, but it is a <laughs> physical being that understands, in a sense, the laws of reality, which the, almost all other gods do not. Yeah, this, this is a very rare thing inside the Warhammer world. We don't have many gods that actually manifest on the physical mortal realm. They just don't do that commonly. And there's a big reason for that that we can possibly discuss in another stream. There's lots of theories for why that's the case, but it generally doesn't happen. The Maw stands contrary to this, completely contrary to this. The Maw is a physical god and an etheric god. So that means it has the connection etherically to the ogre species, the species of its birth, but it also has a, a literal physical place to be, which means that connection has a physical point they can go to. You could argue they're connected to all ogres because of what happened at its birth. This is all supposition rather than definite, but what you don't suppose is that all ogres are going to want to go there at some point. So we can theorize as to why that is, and there's strong reasons for it, but we can't be certain. But I think we could we could write a good thesis that would be very strongly supported with evidence. Yeah, and uh, so uh, Groth the One Finger, who we talked about, he goes to the <laughs> mall and he witnesses it. He makes it to mm -hmm. the edge and he looks down and he sees miles wide this horrifying mouth. That just goes endlessly into yeah. the earth. It's just a big pit of flesh with teeth and all sorts of things sticking out of it. And it's alive. It's breathing. It's pulsating. Yeah. And <laughs> it's so powerful that he witnesses it has the ability to cause earthquakes because it's trying to cause things around the lip of it to fall in so that it mm -hmm. can devour them. Mm -hmm. Which is horrifying um <laughs> so, this is also where we have um one of the most profoundly religious experiences for the ogres occurring the very first ever feast feasts for ogres it's very simple it's just feast no big term for it it's not feast for the more it's just feast just um a, an enormous feast and this feast was not just to praise the Maw and the awesomeness of it, it was to almost share their connection with it and replicate what the Maw does. Now, obviously, there wasn't anything to eat other than themselves. So this also became uh, the starting point of one of their other great big cultural uh, icons almost, and that's the Fighting Pit, um, where they make a representation of the Maw. Uh, so a big, huge pit. Yep. They fill it with whatever it. meat they have and if they have no meat that'll be themselves they line it with stakes or some equivalent to represent all of those teeth that ring around the maw itself and they fight to the death the winner gets to eat the loser it's as simple as that now it uh, when you come to actual pit fighting as it occurs to ogre society later um unless they take their gut plates off and it's guts out it's not to the death it's generally to the finger or to the arm or the the winner gets to eat a bit of the loser but here that wasn't the case it was a great feast on their own tribe, and thousands die as they are eaten by what remains of their tribe, and others are just thrown into the maw, or the maw itself shakes them right down. One of the few survivors, of course, was indeed Groth Onefinger, who becomes the very first ever prophet 
of the ball. Yeah. And what's fascinating about this mo moment is it is likely that there were ogre wizards of a sort, shamans that existed before the coming of the Maw. Um, but seems, seems very likely this is the first time where the ma it notices groth like he is making the supplications to it and he he pleases it and it basically reaches out and starts it in a sense interacts with his mind and it teaches him how to call upon it it teaches him that do these things and i i will answer and he does and all of the something that's very interesting is that the great maw is so much of a changer to the ogres it's such an infiltrator of every aspect of who they are that even the forms of magic that were natural quote unquote like had nothing to do with the maw so ogres are able to use like death magic and heaven's magic and uh beast magic Beast. those are those have been corrupted by the maw as well and that the way the ogres do that now is they see it through the lens of the maw and they still make offerings to the maw they they Always. do the, they do the lore of heavens because they go well the maw came from the heavens so mm -hmm. the heavens is full of these entities and they eat certain kinds of uh pieces of various creatures to try and like reach their minds up into that cosmos to interact with Azir. If they're doing death, the way they conjure death magic is they literally are picking up animals or people or whatever they have and they're butchering them. They're rich doing ritualistic butcherings and using that moment of death to call upon the maw to then unleash death magic and beast magic. They're cracking open animal bones, eating marrow and doing all of these uh, like, uh, other elements of butchery that's more about the devouring aspect the reaching into the primal essence of the things they're eating to call upon beast magic so the maw even when they're not using direct magic of the maw they're always calling upon the maw which yeah. is weird like that's yeah. weird consumption is basically at the heart of what will become gut magic the magic of the more gastromancy um, you know. gastromancy indeed um this um magic of consumption um encompasses all forms of magic that the ogres use it's not just that core the stuff what the more allows to happen it's any form of magic that the ogres can use is tied through and laced interlaced with consumption and this uh massively reflects their wizards which are who are called butchers unsurprisingly um and that doesn't just mean that they themselves are blood drenched fanatics which often they are but all of the various tools and accoutrements that they need to do all of their gut magic are often attached to them in various ways sometimes through them so you'll get hooks attached in their face they look like the worst form of cenobites that you might see out of a horrible hellraiser movie from clive barker but about 12 foot tall instead they are truly horrendous and they often have the biggest of all bellies and unlike other ogres they are always guts out they are always ready to fight to the very death their bellies never covered with gut plates which also coincidentally ensures that they're not accidentally interrupting any flows of the winds of magic because they don't have a giant a giant plate yeah. of metal in front of them but at the same point their consumption uh, allows them to gain access to extra power. Their core spells work quite differently, and the more they eat, the more wounds they get back, because that's just the way good old ogres work. And they are, frankly, terrifying. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting question from Viper Wolf. Uh, does that mean that they would put out a lot of light magic because of their religious kind of uh, religious interactions with the Great Maul? So, um, for those who are capable of perceiving the light wind, so we're looking largely at mostly elves. Uh, light magic's hard. Most people yeah. can't do it. But for those few who could see it, they almost certainly would see emanations of the light wind coming from the ogres. Now, would As that be enough to fuel a spell? Well, Not really. It's a very diffuse light. light mouth. I, yeah. I just, a mouth in the light wind probably terrifying. You just see this giant <laughs> light <laughs> thing. Ah! Truly, truly horrible. Um, so, yeah, they're connected to the maw at all times and they do all their magic through the maw the maw becomes the central point of their culture pretty much from this point forwards when good old one finger returns back to the other the, re the remaining remnants of the ogres in the hills and starts spreading the core concepts of what being with the maw is and many of them start hiking their way back to many of whom get 
shaken down into the mall for their crimes, poor people. And to answer a question that was kicking around, this mall is most certainly a pulsating living entity. It's not just simply a rocky uh, hole in the ground. Oh, yeah, no, it's flesh. It is, it is full on. Point. This is a, an enormous creature. Um, we're not given, I think, anywhere the true dimensions, whether it's, say, for example, the size of the Eye of the Forest, that's Talapine, which is also in a great crater, and um, the city of Talapine, which is approximately, what, 30 miles across, 30, 40 miles across, 100 mile per, uh, perimeter. That would be an expected size, but it wouldn't surprise me if they sometime later on pin it down as being even larger. Yeah, like it's it's one of those like easily seen from space size things, which like yeah. if you know like that's terrifying. Um, <laughs> it takes you have to be fucking gigantic to be that level yeah. of size. But it's um, so super huge. Yeah, so here we're we're gonna kind of leave the ogres at this point. Um, uh, well, okay, no, we're gonna talk, talk about one little last thing, and then we'll leave the ogres, which is that uh, some uh, we had a super chat about the fire mouth earlier. And I do want to talk very briefly about that of mm -hmm, uh, that mm -hmm. ogre religion. What's very interesting and what we kind of talked about a minute ago is that the ogres very much they had a for oh my gosh potrack thank you for the 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 10 gifted subs over on andy's channel thank you that's very generous thank you so much um that, that's a lot of new twitch subscribers you all rock it's Yay, like, i did it's like it's like 50 bucks <laughs> wow i have literally no idea i have there no idea go. what it means i am such a oh. you're all good it, yeah yeah anyway so uh <laughs> there's um the ogres likely had a a religion they had already formed before the arrival of the maw and one of the things the ogres seem to already have understood was celestial worship and that the ogres are noted to have a lot of reverence for the sun and that they see it as this big thing that's out in the heavens that nothing else is as big as it's the biggest thing so therefore, mm -hmm. it must be the strongest. Um, they have a lot of reverence for uh, similarly for the moons because they're quite large compared to everything else in the heavenly sphere. And the ogres seem to worship the sun in particular because it was the biggest. But then the ma showed up and it was even bigger. And then it hit them. <laughs> so like it jumped up in ascendancy. But there are notes that the ogres seem to have held on to that reverence or at least respect for the sun. Because when some of the ogres came across the fire mouth, which is a giant volcano that is like eternally erupting, it is always gushing lava. Um, now, when it actually erupts, it is insane. Like the ogres, it, that is a profoundly religious event for them when the fire mouth actually erupts. But it is forever just kind of barfing up lava. And they it even kind of looks like a big mouth at its absolute peak. The ogres looked at the fire mouth and they saw this giant fiery lava thing that's really hot, and it's the biggest volcano they've ever seen, and some ogre who had, like, a shower thoughts moment, you know, like when you're just sitting in the shower and you're just letting your brain run, some random idea pops into your head, some ogre was looking at that and goes, I bet this is the offspring of the sun and the great maw. And all the ogres around him went, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> And then they started worshiping it and it turned into a God <laughs> that actually blesses the fire bellies with fire magic, which like what <laughs> it's, it's, it's a proper weird thing. <laughs> Those fire bellies though. Yeah. Fire, fire bellies are like, they're scarier than butchers. Honestly. Um, they are, they are one really of the scariest. Scarier. Cults. Um, because they literally train themselves up by eating the hottest things imaginable, which they start off in kind of like a goofy sense, as you would think of like, oh, spicy things. But then they start eating like venoms and other things that literally scald their stomach, boiling water, and they work their way up to literally being able to eat lava. But at least killing. wanting to, and, and that, that and you say that, um, very uh, yeah. few survive the attempt. Yeah, yeah. To, <laughs> Most to, become, die. Yeah, to become a true fire belly, you have to survive ingesting the magma of the fire belly or the fire mouth. Most don't. Once. Only a few do every One time. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, the vast majority fail. But yeah. um, because but they, you know magma. <laughs> yeah, but the the fire mouth. What's interesting is the fire mouth almost seems to suggest that the ogres witnessed. A geographical thing that they correlated with the great maw and they they worshiped it as part of the great maw 
And it almost seems like the great Maw accepted this and blessed the fire mouth with a portion of its own power. Hey, Berta, thank you very much for the uh, super chat. Would could the halflings be a good goblin type symbiotic species for the ogres? Is there evidence that they should live together? Yes, 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 and yes. Um, the, indeed, it's even suggested that that was originally the core design of what the ogres were going to be. They interlinked the two species in the background. They said that the ogres and the halflings came from the same old one stock, and then generally speaking it was deemed that halflings were too silly so they went for the noblars instead that's i'm not entirely sure if that's true i've been told that's true but um in terms of the actual setting they are definitely interlinked and one tribe did this around about 2480 i forget the, the, yeah, the, the masters um yeah um the feast masters that's them thanks um and they did that they just kicked out all the noblars and took halflings in instead and they are notorious for having the best food out of all of the yeah, various they're one of the most they're one of the most powerful ogre tribes um and for all we sort of almost dismiss the ogres as being relatively stupid the ogres have got a lot of pride in how they prepare their food now it's prepared very differently to how we would prepare it <laughs> massively so um yeah. i mean they've got bones in there they've got all manner of horrors in there, but they also have all manner of things that modify the flavor, modify the taste, make it taste better. They're quite happy to try and nom down on Gomrel, for example. Good old Gomrel. I mean, I'll have under dwarf. Star Gomrel. metal? Crip, yeah, get here. Crip, <laughs> King Gomrel. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Giving that one a good go, or at least sucking it out like as a crab. But uh, yes, is the answer. They do do that. They have done that, and they've probably done it before in the past. Yeah. But uh, Andy, what, what are your thoughts on that particular? What, what do you think of so talking about the fire mouth of oh, what yes, fire mouth. How, how like is it just that the fire the the fire bellies managed to inspire enough belief that it sort of gained its own form of divinity or do you think the great ma is heavily involved in that right so um if we look at how gods work in the warhammer world we have multiple potential answers answer number one is that the ogres themselves have uh, believed it so much that this mountain has become effectively a god through belief and those who are capable of channeling magic um, and haven't gone off to become a butcher um, they are the ones that are most likely to survive the process of becoming a proper fire belly um, because they're the ones that, um, through the channeling, save themselves through to speak accidentally. Now, you could argue that they've done that without it ever becoming a god. They actually somehow turn, turn themselves into that. I think that's a weak answer. I much prefer it actually being a god because the warmer world is full of them. I much prefer it being the central point of where that god manifests. It looks like it's an etheric entity, not um, an immaterial one. It could have been an older uh, ogre god that existed already and has been effectively repurposed by the new form. Of well, yeah, it it kind of almost seems like it's a reinterpretation of their sun god. Yeah, from and I think from how they understand the maw to operate, where they're like, well, it has to have a physical presence, otherwise, how can it be? And a it god? does look like a maw as well, so you can see yeah. why that god, out of all the gods that they worshipped beforehand, survived. Um, where I imagine they had at one point a relatively broad pantheon, hmm. um, much like the halflings have a broad pantheon, um, where we're talking about not just five or six gods, far more. But the only gods that we're aware of that survived inside the ogre's pantheon are those that are obviously and directly linked to big mouth things. Um, and that is most certainly a big mouth thing that they can immediately recognize for what it is. And it does devour anything that goes into yeah, it lava. because of all the love in there. Um, and it's a beautiful um, uh, piece of it. When it gets angry and it bubbles forth and everything goes, it's time for war. There's a very clear understanding for what it does. So for me, it seems like it's just a repurposing of an older God. Um, and it's now manifesting this fashion. That seems to be the easiest route, but I'm sure we could come up with some really convoluted theories that were different. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, there's even to say like the mountains of Morn are known for being actually surprisingly spiritual entities and that they move and they eat and like they're alive in a sense. So it could be yeah, fire mouth might have a dormant spirit in it as well. I think that's very likely, particularly if you look towards the more spiritual way that um, the Cathayans, presumably the Nipponese work as well. So the idea that they have great spiritual entities hiding within it makes sense. And we have more than one example of things like entire glaciers going to war against yeah. the ogres of all things. Um, <laughs> yes. they, come, they come to life um, and they rise up and the mountains themselves to a degree do the same thing and it would be very easy to see that being something that got worshipped as effectively a god and one of those spirits going yeah i'm okay with this 
yeah, yeah, we don't have time for it today because we're talking about the Great Mom more than the Yogurts. But there are some there are some wild things happen in the mountains of Horn. <laughs> like truly the very, crazy shit up there. The very yeah. environment is alive and it's fucking bonkers. <laughs> Proper bonkers. Uh, anyway, so getting back to the actual Great Mom itself, we're we're pretty much yes. done with the Yogurts at this point. Um, they yeah, I think so. A, they've established a religion. They've got all yep. this thing going. It has a notable relationship with them. Um, so now before we kind of get into the more broad stuff, we need to talk about the other side. We need to, we need to spin the planet around, uh, um, starfish on the other side. Yes. The, <laughs> you know, anything, anything's a mouth. If you try hard enough, according to the, yeah, it really is. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, the rivers in the empire could each have their own individual god. I think a massive volcano could be a god too. Yes, I absolutely agree. And I think that that makes sense. Um, it's just that the ogres happen to worship this one and not other ones. Um, yeah, there's there's more than yeah, enough they, around they, it. Oh, it's oh. the biggest one they could find. <laughs> it is worth saying that humanity has a relationship with gods. It's a little bit different to most other species. But that's, I think, hmm. a completely different stream. Um, because they do manifest their worship and their magic and everything else in a very different way. All right, right so, so the other end. Let's yes. flip over. Do you so, want to? Do you want to start with the the map thing, yeah, or do you want to talk actually, about for a while first? Uh, no, let's just jump it up straight away, so that we can actually lay it out with a bit of geography. So let's drop ourselves up. Here is the Warhammer world, everyone. Woo! Now, for those of you who don't know, my job is often <laughs> doing cartography. And um, where's Lumbria? It's not on the map. <laughs> I am. Um, just don't start, and we're going to stick with what we're doing. <laughs> Okay, so where's the Great Maw? The Great Maw is up here. There is the Great Maw. We can see exactly where it is. It says the words Great Maw. Now this, I'm using this map specifically because the one where the uh, the Great Maw was very first introduced. Um, this yeah, is and the that, that's consistent map that you got. with the other maps. Yeah. yeah, totally. And there's the map that you got with uh, White Dwarf number 300. This map becomes pretty much the formation map for almost every map that comes out from this point forwards. This is pretty much the studio's version at this point of what is the Warhammer world. The now, map uh, <laughs> um, in, uh, yeah, in good old uh, sixth edition Warhammer, so we're going back a little bit to 2005-ish, um, at, at this point, there's a lovely description of the Maw in the Ogre Kingdom's Army list as it's first released. And it also mentions um, an almost godlike view. And by that, I mean it flips from its normal narrative where it says, oh, and somebody saw this happen and this happened. And it says, and if anybody could see. And then it starts describing what happens next as the Maw eats its way through the world and it adds this to the timeline as well i'm going to bring up a comment there which is probably going to make things look a bit weird hey viper thanks very much is the sea god pissed at the maw butt in its front yard <laughs> you, the, you you joke but that's actually something important we're going to talk about in a little bit it totally is <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll, um, we'll get around to that so it eats through the world and it doesn't do it immediately it takes two years Two years later on the timeline, it comes through the other side of the world in the opposite hemisphere. And it is directly quoted as being in the opposite hemisphere. And this is later on quoted again in the 8th edition. So we're now talking 2011-ish. Um, so the official version, as far as the studio is concerned, if we go down to this corner, here. And look at that big dark hole at the bottom of the world over so we're now on the opposite side of the world almost equidistant away from the equator if i pull out imagine our equator sitting approximately here we've got the great maw sitting there we've got the butthole of the world sitting down there and the butthole of the world is anything but a butthole as it says there no ships return from here and there is a fine reason for that it's also worth noting that this um in the lore that we receive later is directly connected to the great ocean in a variety of ways that we'll probably discuss as we go um but there is the other side of the world and where it goes now this is where i'm going to do my small point of contradiction because it is worth highlighting if you play warhammer well total war warhammer you'll find that it's in a very different place approximately there um but there is something that's cited there already that's directly related to the lore that they use. So I think there's a good justification. But we can get onto that when we start discussing what is down in the other side of the world. Yeah, and there, there's, a, there's, a, I actually do think that there's, we'll, we'll get into it in a minute. 
Yeah, um, we, 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 will. We, we will get into the Total War decision in a minute. I, I don't think they're actually wrong putting it there, nope. but we'll get into I why. think it's the best decision for the game. Yeah. Um, hey, Rob, thank you very much. Hugely appreciated. Love the lower streams. Keep them up. We intend to. If the Great Mall was created from Warpstone, is it influenced when Chaos waxes and wanes? I think almost certainly, but that's everything magic is influenced when um, Chaos mm. magic waxes and wanes. Don't think that magic is chaos per se. Magic is the... Uh, physical representation of etheric energy and all gods not don't just live on they are etheric energy so yeah, the answer chaos, to that is yes chaos is a subcategory of ether not e not everything is a subcategory of chaos i think a lot of people tend to get those mixed up yeah they do um although you tend to find that there is a prevalent belief amongst some writers that anything to do with the aether is automatically chaos with a big c not a small c to which I say, boo to boo on you sir yeah. <laughs> this is not my personal uh, i've done a lot of warhammer writing in my time and it's not my personal per uh, perspective but some writers do believe this um fortunately i was in a position where i could uh, nix that idea when i was producer for the fantasy roleplay game because i nixed that hard <laughs> not my preference hey michael thank you so much for dropping by enormously appreciated Man, okay, so are, I think that's y'all are in a frenzy today, guys. Thank you so much for all you the support. You are so, so awesome. Um, I think that's everything we need for the map. I think all we need to say from this is we know where the Maw is. It's in the top in the top hemisphere, depending on which way you look at the Warhammer world, the northern hemisphere, beside Grand Cathay and on the opposite side of the world, we have ourselves something that was marked by Games Workshop at that point as the alternative side. And they wrote in their lore pretty much the month this map was released that on the opposite side of the world opposite to the mall there was a great secondary mall um mm. or second mall that was also ringed with teeth and sat on the other side yeah so let's talk about the maelstrom so there there are two there are two categories here which are both important which is the galleon's graveyard and yes. uh the the maelstrom maelstrom of skulls if you want yeah. to give it its full name yeah the maelstrom another 10 gift subs oh my god on twitch twitch is like we see youtube we want in on that action thank you guys wow is that doom from doom pig? Pig. Thank doom you, pig you rock doom pig doom, doom pig <laughs> <laughs> Pardon now, me, have <laughs> singing doom pig songs. <laughs> Thanks, doom pig. so uh so <laughs> you're such a dork andy <laughs> i am <laughs> <laughs> so um the galleons so the the maelstrom of skulls is what ultimately creates the Galleon's Graveyard. But the Galleon's Graveyard is a much larger area that surrounds the Maelstrom of Skulls, which I'm just going to call the Maelstrom from now on to make it easier. Um, so the Maelstrom is the other end of the Maw, where at some point the great the, the thing that is the Great Maw ate its way through the entire planet. Like it either either how now how it did that you know whether it was just teeth and flesh and muscle literally grinding its way through rock and magma until it emerged on the other side or whether it was the remainder of the chunk of warp stone altering everything as it was pushing through or just weird magic bullshit shenanigans pick your poison <laughs> Yeah, pretty but, much. Um, I will say, though, that we know for a fact that um, we've got ourselves lots of warp stone. Warp stone breaks reality. So we've got more than enough justification for simply saying it happened. That's all you need to know as to exactly what that means. Is there a big snaking tunnel? It, it's not just unlikely. It's almost certainly not the case. But is it connected end to end? Yes, definitely. Um, yes. But it almost certainly probably goes through the aether. Yeah, yeah, I would if you fell in, it's you would not fall all the way through. There is a there is a stomach, so to speak, but it's probably not in reality. It's probably somewhere else. Um yeah, 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 yeah. so which, you know, makes it way worse than it would have been. It, it it would honestly probably be far easier if you could just fall into you just died normally. It's probably way worse. But uh <laughs> don't fall into the great mod. It's not I would not recommend for anyone. Neither so would I. Uh Here. what's interesting is so the Maelstrom of Skulls emerges in the ocean, and this is a very dramatic event. It alters the ecology of an entire region of the planet, where it is this colossal mouth that is truly bottomless. There, mm -hmm. like, because it empties out out of reality, so a big whirlpool starts to form as it begins to just drink the ocean. Now, eats everything now the maelstrom of skulls is of course very literally just ripped straight from uh the odyssey and that it's it's charybdis 
um, of that it is a monstrous entity that swallows a lot of the ocean, but then very key vomits it back up. Um, except for it doesn't give back any of the things that it eats during that. It only throws back up the water, um, which is probably why the ocean has not drained away by this point because <laughs> it's been thousands of years. Um, so it, it swallows a bunch and anything that happens to get caught in that swallowing is processed into whatever happens what it, with what it eats. And then it vomits out all the water back up and then it does it over and over and over and over ad infinitum. But it's worse because the very nature of this other mole, the mole on the other side, is much like the mole on the other side. And it is interlaced with warp stone. Mm -hmm. It completely doesn't change the ecology in that, oh, there's fewer fish and they're getting sucked in and eaten. It's much worse than this. Spiritually, this place is broken. Souls get sucked from across the ocean into this area. So much so that it becomes a central story point for various NPCs. Various NPCs, pardon me, various Warhammer characters. <laughs> oh, I'm still so caught up with playing oh, man, Warhammer fans. Somebody's, Fantasy, somebody's, there. somebody's <laughs> author skill is Anthony's like, by the way, did you know I write Wolfram? <laughs> <laughs> so these characters, holy shit, I can't believe I said that. Um uh if people die, they will sometimes purposefully try to get themselves over to wherever this place may be in the hope that they will find the soul of whoever is lost at sea. It's also worth noting that nobody knows where this place is. This isn't a happy, oh, I know where the good old Galleon's graveyard is, where all ships from across the ocean get sucked to. Oh, I know where that is. It's just over there. They don't. They don't know it exists um, in terms of its physical location. They just don't exist in terms of the spiritual development and everything on that. Let me just... Oh, my Lord! Godzilla, I wonder how much sea life gets devoured a year. <laughs> Shed load. And oh, and we'll take white. Oh, dude, thank you very much. I don't have anything to ask. I just want uh, Twitch chat to win. Yeah, I thanks. don't want Twitch chat to win. <laughs> I don't. No, I say, I'm not He's like, fuck Twitch chat. <laughs> you, you, fuck you, Twitch. Seriously, though. No. Thank you for the great videos, both Lure Beard, Sotex, Lure Vids, and Andy's Warrior Fantasy Real Play. Actual plays. Great listening while working on my own world browsing projects. Thank you on this side. I cannot express that enough. Is my mic gone there? No, you're fine. You're fine. So I think oh, okay. I think sometimes when you get on a particular ramble, you'll like grab it like you're going on a sermon, and that's when it gets weird. Oh, okay. I'll, so, so, no, you can grab it at the bottom. <laughs> don't don't grab the shaft. Just grab <laughs> just you know, keep it further back. <laughs> Fucking hell. We're having a day. <laughs> um so anyway, the Galleon's graveyard. Um what's what's really interesting about it, uh where yeah, where uh, <clears throat> Actually, you're not wrong. <laughs> you're not wrong. So but he has to get there first. Yeah. Okay. So, um, a, a lot of people are wanting to get to the get to the end, but we have to explain how we get there first. Yeah. So absolutely. What, like Andy said, the maw has is horribly irradiated with magic, um, yeah. horribly full of warp stone, and when it emerged into the ocean, there was likely a blast of magic. Like this was probably like not dissimilar to when the moss struck the planet where mm -hmm. there was probably this like unholy unleashing of <laughs> chat y'all need to chill <laughs> y'all need to y'all need to calm down uh, <laughs> uh this unholy um emergence of magic that altered reality in that very mm -hmm. moment and what's interesting is that like how a lot of the ogres died when the great maw impacted it is also very likely that a massive amount of sea life was obliterated the moment yeah. the, the the maelstrom of skulls emerged. And what's interesting is that we've already talked about how the Great Maw is already interwoven with death. Oh, Twitch is on the loose. Fuck my Twitch friend. chat. <laughs> Twitch, you're not going to take that. Y'all should give us money to tell off. <laughs> to tell off. Uh, uh, you too. Anyway, moving on. But uh, don't you don't have to do that. I'm sorry. That was <laughs> anyway. So, um, when the Great Maw happened, we we've talked about there's a lot of shayish uh, interwoven with the Maw because eating involves death, uh, especially when it's a it's such a meat thing. You know, the Great Maw is not vegan. It's not vegetarian. It does not care for any of that. It wants meat. It wants to consume yep. life. Um, it wants blooded life with souls and all the goodies that come with it. Big giant ogre. Ah. And, yeah. And the the maelstrom of skulls is the same. It emerges into the ocean and it likely kills a horrendous amount of sea life 
large, horrible primordial creatures at the depths of the ocean and everything that you'd find above that. Because And what's very, very interesting is that traditionally, the oceans of the warmer world are viewed as almost the greatest um, gathering places of Gyran because water draws life magic to it like crazy. Mm -hmm. This is why the incarnate elemental of life is literally just a big sea elemental because the ocean is full of Gyran, but it's also full of Gur because big sea creatures. creatures and, and it's a wilderness in and of itself. Yeah, so the Maelstrom causes such a horrific amount of death that it fundamentally changes the laws of the entirety of the ocean, which is that it becomes a central focal point of death. Yep. And it starts drawing in everything dead. And what's interesting is I think in this big cataclysmic moment, I think this is actually when the Galleon's graveyard is made. And yeah. I have, I have a great bit of a Jonathan says, given the great oh. maw is so full of warp stone, the Skaven could, would probably try to mine it. So what happens if they tunnel their way into the great maw? Yum, yum, yummy. Yeah, he, um, I'm pretty yeah, I think sure a lot of stupid Skaven have been eaten. Yeah, I would say it would, I would say it is undeniable probably that there have been yeah. Skaven that tried to dig under and into it and they did and it just ate them. Yeah. <laughs> Don't think of it as um, an entirely, um, let's say, sedentary maw that does not move it eats it shakes it moves it almost certainly has bits of it that can just flop down a corridor of any steven or stupid up there and just suck them in this is a living god that's down there and it is not uh yeah to, incapable. To the if reason we eat, it will eat yeah so the reason so this is our first we, we should have said this at the beginning this is our first spooktober lore beards oh yeah and, yeah, may have that. Oh. yeah one of the things that we that it's worth thinking about the great maw even without the gallons graveyard side is y'all have to remember this is a living entity so mm -hmm. it comes with everything think about how big the maw is right like it's probably hundreds of miles wide and thousands and thousands of miles deep but you have to think this is a living entity which means there are things in it there is an yeah. ecosystem down there of yep. magical bacteria parasites that are probably bigger than people that mm -hmm. are defending it and also eating it. And mm -hmm. it like, there's probably a whole thing going on down there. So if the Skaven, even if they burrow into it, there's probably going to be tendrils and other things that are trying to get them. The equivalent of defenders. Yeah. And there's going to be things down there and the Skaven. Like blood cells. Yeah. The Skaven have probably not learned their lesson knowing them. There's probably still <laughs> clans that uh, every once in a while go in, but the vast majority of the Skaven are probably like, yeah, no, not worth it. <laughs> I mean, Thanks, who knows? <laughs> greenskins, greenskins adapt. I underwater greenskins wouldn't really surprise me that much. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> we, <clears throat> I mean, we, but uh, anyway, so my crackpot theory because I want Andy's take. Go with your crackpot theory first. My, here's my crackpot it. theory. So when the Great Maw impacted the world, I think that it only managed to get the Warpstone Desert and the Maw itself because it hit actual Earth. It hit the ground. Right. And we know that the earth itself is a good grounding material for magic. It kind of dissipates a lot of the initial um, nastiness. And I think that prevented it from creating like a realm of chaos. Instead, it only got more of a chaos waste. But the ocean did not have that luxury. Yep. Water, water does not have that same property. So I think that when it emerged on the other side of the planet, it did create functionally its own little realm of chaos which is what the galleon's graveyard is I, I would say less a realm of chaos i would say um uh an etheric realm yeah uh, yeah sorry no, it's, a, a realm, you know so but like, i agree an, an I, Lauren or a, whatever you yeah, want to call it yeah. I, in fact i'll go further than Athel Lauren. It's, it's it's a proper hellhole down there where the aether has mixed and intermixed and flows through constantly ebbing and flowing with everything down to the heart of the maelstrom itself um i'll we'll also bring one up one other thing let me just bring back the map so i want to show you something that i think most people haven't considered but is most certainly worth having a look at if we uh, actually look at the geography here. Now, you may note, and we have a quick look at the arsehole of the world down in the bottom corner. Um, and if we have a look at the coastlines, Ooh, oh on man, the other I was really side, tempted to say a comment and I managed to not say it. I'm really proud well of done. myself. Look <laughs> how shattered they are. All the way along the coastlines of the West are absolutely shattered. And it really does suggest that unlike the other side, which was 
potentially, arguably curtailed by the Cathayans. On this side, it was not. When eventually mm. it burrowed through and broke into the other side, that was a cataclysmic event. And it looks very likely, given that we have ourselves quite clear cataclysm damage, all the way down through that. Look at that enormous hole all the way through the center of the, um, the north. Yeah, the boiling sea and the broken there. lands and everything. It's it's like if it's it's broken. Um, so it suggests that the land itself was broken by this process. Now it might not have been this. It could have been another event, but this is most certainly a, a prime candidate oh, because there's going to be no one that, down there. Just like the idea, yeah. of, like it caused such a like a series of earthquake and tsunamis that the entire western shoreline of the that entire side of the planet was just obliterated. Yeah, totally. We, and I think there's, that's there's the nobody over there that we know of that's like still so around. Hold it. And if you if you consider, say, for example, the Lizardmen, there's an entire swathe of mountains to stop all the tidal waves um, on their land. So the tidal waves come out, they hit those mountains, and they recede again. So they'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, anyway, wonder... had held Paladin. Mm -hmm. Just curious, but would Ogre's pilgrimage to the Maelstrom in the same vein that they go to the Maw? Count Noctilus wouldn't sleep well if they did. I think the answer is, if they knew where it was, and if they got close enough and they could feel its draw probably but it's so so far away you've got to remember the location that we have here on this map and i'm going to bring the map up again just to do it it's just to show that it's on this side of the world on the opposite side if we did a full map of the warhammer world it's quite possible that the other side is all water and this is just a representation of loosely where it is. It could be possible that you would have to travel for weeks to get to it, meaning that no ogre would feel that pool in the same way that they feel the pool um, that yeah, uh, weeks, comes from the mall. Yeah, weeks if you set out from Lustria would probably take yeah, totally. That's what I mean. Yeah, years if you set out from the old world. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a location that is so remote, so distant that uh, it's enormously unlikely that the ogres would feel it. But I do think that if we are going with the maw being a spiritual draw for them, that yes, they would feel it. And it's possibly why you don't have loads and loads of stories of ogres all over Lustria. And the few ogres that um, are kicking around Nagaroth are generally working for Dark Elves. And they're in the Northern Hemisphere really high, and they are almost certainly going to be closer yeah. to the maw. Yeah, and what's interesting is the Dark, Elves, the, the Dark Elves do not go south. They do no. not go to that part of the world. They go through the underwater. Uh, I, I can't draw on the map, but they, they go from their part of Nagaroth through the underwater sea to pop out at the boiling sea, and then they go straight east. They don't go south. It's more, it's, it's more north than that, but it's hard to show. Yeah, it's all good. That's, that's good enough. Yeah, that, that, but, that'll uh, do. Well, let's get but, to the maps. Let's get back to just seeing our big, yeah. ugly noggins. Yeah, so what's what's interesting <laughs> is that uh, would it make sense that the Maelstrom is the part that hit the planet and is actually the face and bigger than the other end? In the sense, <clears throat> I, I, I think we have enough evidence that suggests that it went the other way, but if you think of it in that it was building up power or building up, like, pressure. Pressure is a better term that it might have been just building up more and more and more pressure before it emerged in the maelstrom, there might have been a bizarrely spectacular explosion on that side than you might have thought. Like, if like, oh, well, you know, maybe it's smaller because it's had to go through all that earth. It could be the opposite, where it had yeah, it so much pressure built up behind it that when it finally got there, the explosion was even worse. Yeah, I'm, I, I would be happy to make almost any interpretation there. I mean, if, for example, we were sitting down and trying to write it, it would be in the end which one makes for the coolest story. Yeah. Um, and, and what we definitely have is that an impact occurred on the Maw side rather than the Maelstrom side, um, because that impact was seen, it came down, it thudded in, it blew up, it went everywhere, so it definitely occurred on that side. You could argue that maybe two... Uh, a hit and yeah. it's just been converged but i think the actual story as it stands which is that an ogre deity has eaten its way through the world and in its simplicity it doesn't eat any further it just has eaten as much as it can and it now just with its mouths eats yeah, whatever comes close to it it just swallows and swallows and swallows it's already done the eating in that direction it doesn't eat in other directions because it's arguably too simple much like the ogres themselves it's a perfect reflection of their culture so one of the things that Andy talked about that I also want to reiterate on, because, you know, some of y'all have asked, like, why don't the ogres go to the Maelstrom? The thing that's really interesting about the Maelstrom of Skulls is that it's very unique because of the Galleon's Graveyard. Although there is a place on the map where I believe it surfaced, it does not actually show up in a particular place in the world. You cannot, you cannot get to the Galleon's Graveyard through mundane means. 
There is a magical process you have to go through to get there. It is on a almost a separate plane of reality. It what draws a fine way, fine way of um covering Total War is an yeah. interesting choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the that's why Count Noctilus, who we're gonna get to in a second, is able to do the bullshit that he does. Is because he figures that out. Of that, people have looked for the maelstrom. Like Andy said, if someone was desperate enough to find a lost loved one that the sea devoured, you would need to go to the maelstrom. The, those that are magically powerful enough have figured out that everything dead in the ocean is being drawn somewhere. But what's freaking them out is they can't figure out where it is, which shouldn't be the case. Like the Iles, the Iles control the seas for a lot of their a lot of their uh, empire. They should have been able to figure out where it was, but they can't because it's not necessarily a physical. <laughs> it's not a physical place in the sense that you could just run up on it. I'm not sure that's definitely confirmed. Um, I, I'm not disagreeing because I think that makes sense of a lot. Um, mm. But I'm not sure that's definitely confirmed. I mean, Prince Jurelian, that's Finubar's son. Um, he, he goes looking for his brother who dies at high sea. Um, and there's no particularly call, no large call out that he used magic to do it. However, it is called out that he is a highly skilled wizard. So... I mean, age, I suppose we're talking about high elves here. So I think we have all the tools to ensure that that is the case. And if you were trying to rationalize it, I think that's exactly what I do because it allows for Total War's version to still sort of make sense because Noctilus, who is desperate to find this place, um, he's also, as it turns out, a mag an absolute master of the Grey Wind, Algu. And he um, basically finds a way to teleport himself directly to the Maelstrom. Well, to the Galleon's graveyard in particular. He spends an ancient amount, an enormous age trying to figure it out and eventually mm. does it. And he does that from his castle, which is very, very usefully right in the center of the Great Ocean. And pretty much in exactly the place, one could argue, that was marked out by Total War. So that all works in that that's where his castle was. And he teleports not just him, his entire fucking castle round the globe to another place, um, quite clearly marked as to the opposite side of the ocean. Yet still, all the way through the descriptions of the other characters, they keep referring to the Great Ocean. So you can still get that little bit of magic was used and there's a portal and there's things that go that allow it to sort of make sense. Anyway, sorry, pardon me. Uh, Sean says hi. Hi, Sean. Yeah, Sean, would Lumbria be affected by the Maelstrom Emergence or the Galleon's Graveyard? So Lumbria is kind of a complicated subject because it... Mm, do you want to take that one? Nope. So, okay, here's here's what I'll say. Here's what I'll say, because my understanding is probably not as deep as Andy's is. Lumbria, whether or not Lumbria is actually a place is highly debatable um, in that we have a single map that somebody made. I don't even know who made it, where he goes Lum myth rumored Lumbria this way, and he points yep. off the east of the map. It could be that Lumbria is literally just Lustria that somebody has stumbled upon from the east, and he was like, oh, I found a new continent. I named the Lumbria, but it turns out it's just Lustria. Um, or it could be that it's an actual place that for some reason hasn't appeared on any maps. Um, and it could be that it just showed up once from some guy and the Games Workshop looked at it and was like, yeah, no, we're not doing that. Yeah, no, we're not doing that again. Because <laughs> um, it's never appeared since. Like, it, they, yeah, it, it's, it doesn't even get mentioned. It's um, one of those dead pieces of... Eh. Yeah, it, it's... That being said, if it was nope. out there, it almost certainly would have had some It'd make issues. for a really interesting story. Like, for example, it was destroyed by it. That would have been quite fun. Yeah. Hey, Viper. How did the Deepkin in Age of Sigmar get saved by the Sea God if the Maw was taking souls from him? I think that the answer Here. is... Oh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, I've, I've, those are... I, I say this not in like a the, like a rah, sense, but like those are just so not related. Just yeah, that's so not related at all. Yeah, um, the answer is we're dealing with two very different systems. Um, and they, I, the, the Deepkin are in a completely different. Yeah, if I mean, if you're asking about like the, there are some references within the Deepkin that the Deepkin see it as Manon saved a lot of their souls from the predations of Slanesh at the end of the world. That Not has less. That has very little to do with the the Great Maw, and more to do with kind of the desperate last scrambles that were happening in the end times. Mm -hmm. Because the Maw, the Maw, like 
unfortunately just didn't really get to play a part because games workshop just decided to leave the ogres out of it um oh, I'm still, it makes me so sad yeah it it probably would have been involved in a sense like if someone had been writing the setting correctly and using everything that they had to hand the galleon's graveyard probably would have been a very dramatic point within the end times um with all the people dying at sea but um anyway and almost certainly wasn't because um, the game that it was attached to, Dreadfleet, was not a good game. It was dripping <laughs> with atmosphere, Horribly literally balanced. dripping with atmosphere. Um, it looked great, and I loved pulling it out. The miniatures were gorgeous, but the game was terrible, which was such a shame because Man of War, the game that preceded it as the high seas game from Games Workshop, was actually brilliant. Yeah, so Dread the Dreadfleet's a funny instance of someone that had incredible writing and incredible artists, and I think they probably also made the rules, <laughs> and they mm. didn't know how to make the rules. <laughs> yeah, the, the rules are not great. Um, and interestingly, um, the Dreadfleet copies that were all sent down to um, Australia were largely just, to tie into this comment, they were just destroyed. Yeah, a lot, they, a lot they, of Dreadfleet was destroyed it just didn't sell enough and it's like such a shame you could have just given it to me <laughs> yeah which is hilarious because now it's like a hot hot collector's yeah. item absolutely I, even though the game itself is yeah but the minis great. the minis are so good it's like it, who cares <laughs> thanks again viper you yeah. rock uh yeah, yeah the minis do are appreciate great. the question um so to get back to kind of talking about the Gal graveyard a little bit within and i'll say this is within the dreadfleet story so there mm -hmm. are arguments that can be made. The Dreadfleet story tells that the Gallon's Graveyard does not have a physical place. It is somewhere that is like, there's kind of like a barrier between it and the rest of reality. And you have to use certain magical means to get through that barrier to arrive in the Gallion's Graveyard. But the, the advantage of that is what Count Noctilus takes advantage of. But first we need to explain who the fuck is Count Noctilus for anyone that doesn't know. So Nicholas von Karstein, um, was a Sylvanian vampire of the von Karstein lineage who lived in the mm -hmm. center of Sylvania. And he had a big old castle um, that is not marked. Uh, I Actually, it might be marked on the, one of the more recent maps, but uh, he had a big castle. And it, uh, supposedly he's in the near the it. center of Sylvania or he's somewhere. It, it, it said central Sylvania, but that could be a lot of places. Um, mm. And it's very likely his castle was set up on magical ley lines because vampires are not stupid and they like to build their places in magical significant areas. Um, and he, I mean, Sylvania itself naturally gathers a significant amount of dar in a variety of ways because of all the things that have happened there anyway. So, yeah, yeah sorry. Not I know I know it's like Nightklaus, Nicklaus. I'm going to say Nicholas because it's just that looks like the goofy way they're trying to write it in like an old, an old world type of way of writing I, nicholas it's not even no that's an actual way of spelling nicholas oh yeah nicholas. okay so shut up chat I'm trying to make fun of my um, pronunciations no, shut up no, no, um, <laughs> your pronunciations are hilarious anyway um, that's not let's move on swiftly yeah, that's not that's not what you're here for don't come to me for pronunciations i'm american leave me alone but not only am i american i'm texan so it's like it's worse just leave me out all your pronunciations are thus correct and the rest of the world is wrong yeah I have more guns than you. Leave me alone. But <laughs> anyway, so uh, <laughs> Jesus. So um, uh, von Kar Nicholas von Karstein, he, what's very interesting about him is like all von Karsteins, he desires power. He's very arrogant. He wants to be the emperor of everything. And he, von Karsteins are quite noted for having delusions of grandeur compared to even the other bloodlines. Now he takes a very different approach um to uh the other von karsteins which a lot of them at this point are squabbling over sylvania uh manfred is off hiding away doing his own little shenanigans and in manfred's absence it's mostly infighting um or just you know trying to avoid getting the empire to notice you and accidentally declare a new vampire war because then everyone would be pissed at you um so nicholas is hiding in his castle and he's trying to find an alternative way to get to power without having to fight all the other vampires because he does not like Sylvania that much uh, because he's very irritated by all of his siblings. Um, so he starts doing a lot of research. And one of the things that he comes across is mentions of how everything that dies in the great ocean is being drawn somewhere. And that like souls are being drawn somewhere. Corpses mm -hmm. are being drawn somewhere. 
the ocean like in a lot of places like should be full of dead but it's not like battlefields on great naval battlefields much quicker than should be possible will just be full of nothing but like basic debris before long because something is pulling them away and he's like huh that's interesting and what he realizes is that everything that dies at sea sailors sea monsters sea creatures uh people caught in tsunamis and pulled back out just anything is being all drawn to one place and he realizes that must be one of the biggest fucking concentrations of death magic and dar in existence like that must be in one of the most powerful places that could possibly fathom fathomably exist and Did he's you see fathom? yeah thank you uh and he <laughs> he uh in his research, a lot of his research is from um, like elven archmages yeah. that are trying to research this and from a lot of other vampires and necromancers who have tried to find this place and failed. And so he does more and more research. And what's interesting about Nicholas is that instead of researching specifically into death and dark magic, he decides to research shadow magic. Yeah. And he starts going really deep into trying to break illusions and figure out why no one else can find this place. And he finally figures it out. Um, he learns that the Gallon's Graveyard has always been a myth. Uh, it's always been something that people have believed. I'll, I'll interrupt. It. I'll, I'll say one thing. He, he's not into illusions. He's into translocation. And yeah, yeah, I was about to get to that. Yeah. But yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, that he, he comes up with the idea that he wants to get himself there. And mm -hmm. so he starts getting really big into teleportation, which Olgu falls very heavily under. And he gets so strong and so obsessed with shadow magic, he goes from, oh, no, I'm not going to teleport myself there. I'm going to teleport my entire fucking castle there and then some. <laughs> and so he pulls the classic, which is he waits for a Geheimnisnacht, um, and he unleashes a big old ritual where he, like, he summons a... a there's a goofy note about the ritual where it's like, I think he's like, he personally murders like 120 people or something like that. <laughs> and he resurrects them. Of course them. I do. Yeah. And <laughs> I he... murder them all. <laughs> <laughs> or no, no, it's 1,200. That's what it is. It's like 1,200 people he killed himself. And then he resurrects all of them in a big ritual and they make a circle around his lands and he casts a ritual and everything within that circle just vanishes. One sacrifice. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Two sacrifices as he counts his way through them all. <laughs> yeah. And we we do actually have on the timeline uh when he successfully does this, which is like in the yep. 2510s or something yep. like that. Really um, late. So if you're playing Wolfrup, you can fully do a campaign that involves this whole shenanigan and get caught yeah. up in it because it's actually very relevant. Um, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 3, they released a mini expansion for it actually. Really? I really hope they redo it it's, for fourth. It's a tiny little like card-based mini expansion. It's really small. And it was it, it almost felt like something they were asked to do by Games Workshop to try and promote the game because it had almost no relevance at all oh, to anything else. Like, how how popular it's become because of like total yeah. war. Um yeah. but anyway, so um so this big ritual goes off, it takes days to cast. It's a huge ritual, mm -hmm. which it should be. He's doing something absolutely fucking ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And he teleports himself, his entire mm -hmm. legion, his armies, and his castle and the mountain it sits upon. <laughs> he teleports all of that um, literally across the entire planet, which is fucking insane. <laughs> um, and like magical feats wise, it's one of the craziest things I think we ever see a vampire do. Um, I, mean, I mean, if you actually, well, vampire, yes, perhaps. Va vampire specifically. <laughs> Yeah, if you consider the greater scheme of magical things, I mean, the elves did something similar. They basically tore their castles off of parts of Elvira yeah, and yeah. just floated them across the ocean. Yeah, so it's like, not unprecedented, but it is proper crazy. Yeah, and what's really interesting is that, although it doesn't specify it, I think a little bit of writing that I would have loved for them to include is I suspect that he may have used the fact that he is undead and his castle is full of nothing but the dead and almost kind of, in a sense, cast himself adrift on this magical pathway that draws all dead things to the graveyard. Um, I think that's a really good line, and it's one that I'd support as well. I think it uh, makes sense and justifies why a vampire was required to pierce, pierce this particularly difficult ritual. Um, yeah, I'd agree with that. I think that works really nicely. Yeah, but anyway, so he shows up. 
in the Galleon's graveyard. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is when he initially appears, like his castle just thuds down. Um, and like we said, it draws all the dead to it. So the Galleon's graveyard is a nightmare realm where yeah. it is full of death where like every single corpse that is in the ocean and not immediately taken out gets brought here eventually. So it has islands made out of dead where like it's islands, like whole islands that are just made out of bone or some big yep. sea monster carcass or yep. yada, 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 yada. Um, there's even, what's interesting is there's even um, notes about that things that you would not necessarily think of as dead, but are, have been drawn here. There's a dead God that actually mm -hmm. gets drawn to the gallon's graveyard. There's a volcano God whose volcano and the Island and his altars got devoured because he was dead. Um, mm. He doesn't seem to have been worshiped anymore and was left behind. And this volcano God is still alive. Like he's still active. Like the, the magic in the galleon's graveyard seems to give him enough activity to be a threat. Cause if you play the game, the volcano God's Island is like, you want to stay the fuck away from it um, yeah. because it is ugly. I'm going to add a couple of little extra things just to consider while we um, go through the what is effectively the uh, almost the afterlife of the sea down here hmm. by this great maw, this god that sits at the base of it with its great massive maelstrom that sucks everything down. Um, we have many sources across the various Warhammer sources that make it clear that there are various ways that souls that die at sea do not get dragged down there. Those who are perhaps dedicated to Manan, who, who make the correct observances or similar. So their soul might not go, but their body will probably. In a similar fashion that uh, you don't often with necromancy necessarily get the person who was in the corpse coming back. It's just a zombie. It's animated flesh. It's not the soul of the person in there. Um, uh, there's obviously ways to get souls too. Necromancy is a multi varied discipline that comes in a variety of different fashions. But similarly, not everything goes down there, but everything that's unclaimed or everything that doesn't have some method of getting away from it certainly does. I find out of all the stories, one of the most interesting ones is the elves thinking that some go down there because really I can't see any way that that would occur with the established lore that we have because the elven souls almost certainly go to the Prince of Pleasure if they're not otherwise protected or they go into a way shard or something similar. If they're saying that you can just jump into the sea and have your soul ditch around down there, I imagine some elves would have done that. They would have used it. There would probably be an elven enclave down there attempting to avoid the worst that the Chaos Gods can offer. So I think there's definitely a certain level of desperation in the stories that have elves thinking that this may be the case, in that they just simply mm. aren't accepting the truth. What I think would make a slightly better version of that would be the way shard has fallen into the water. And Ooh. that's got swept away. And they're after the way shard. They're not after the soul per se, but the soul is in the way shard. That's what they're chasing. And suddenly mm -hmm. it all makes sense. Yeah. I, th I think that would make a lot more sense. Yeah. Cause yeah. The, what's interesting about the maelstrom is that I would think, I would suggest that it, it's kind of the bottom feeder when it comes to mm. the ocean of that. It will, it's going to suck up everything that somebody else does not have claim on. But if anybody else has claim, it's, it almost always loses those little engagements. But that's fine because the vast majority of stuff is not claimed mm. uh, because doing doing proper like being <laughs> obeying all the rules you have to in order for your soul to go where you want it to go is actually a, a little bit harder, especially when it comes to the ocean, which is a treacherous son of a bitch. Um, and a lot of people do not realize they're going to die before they're just dead. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, um, the Maelstrom is this massive place of death. and. What's interesting is before Noctilus gets there, or Nicholas, but he becomes known as Count Noctilus. Yeah, I um, think he renames himself, actually, doesn't he? He, he does, but there's there's actually kind of a funny, like, when it talks about his profile in the book, it almost implies that everyone else calls him Count Noctilus, as opposed mm. to himself. Like, it almost seems like he doesn't count, call himself that. It's just a name that pirates and other people have attributed to him. I'm sure he does yep. call himself that. Um, but it's weird. Like there's a Dread Fleet novel, which is quite fun. I think it was written by Phil Kelly. Maybe I've not, um, I've not read that one. So it's, it's you'll a, be ahead of me there. Yeah, It's, it's not a very big long book. It's fun. Oh. Um, but what's weird about it is Count Noctilus never talks. He shows up like they have the big final battle and he dies in the end, but like he never says a word. 
Um, or uh, he, like he, interesting he, choice. Yeah, it's almost implied he doesn't speak Reichspiel, which is really funny, <laughs> but because he just never says anything. Um, like everybody else talks, but he doesn't, which is so weird. But anyway, um, what's very interesting is that before he arrives, it's very heavily implied that the Galleon's graveyard is just that a graveyard that there doesn't actually seem to be as much dark magic and there doesn't seem to be much in the way of undeath. It's mostly just death. But when he gets there, he starts screwing with everything and he learns how to bind himself to the maelstrom of skulls. And when he does that, he fundamentally changes the magic in the galleon's graveyard where all of a sudden, instead of being more of just Shaish, it just becomes metric amounts of Dar, obscene amounts of Dar. And all of a sudden, all of the dead things start to wake up and start to move. And he just immediately sets about building yeah. up an empire uh, within the Galen's empire. graveyard, which is why it, it takes him about 10 years before he even starts appearing outside of the Galen's graveyard. And it's because he spends a ton of time basically resonating himself with all of the magic within the galleon's graveyard and converting all of this shayish that's hanging around into proper dar for necromancy mm -hmm. and he goes nuts because the amount of magic in there is just unspeakable and if you put a necromancer with that like i mean he's basically equal to nagash almost uh at some parts of nagash's life with how strong he is magically of he starts raising up like tens of thousands of dead things, massive sea monsters. And of course, mm -hmm. the more he does this, the more Dar is just settling. So things start coming alive without his involvement, which why find things... particularly. Oh, yeah. I was just going to add a little bit. Um, what I find particularly interesting is many of the things that start resurrecting um, have all of their characters still in place, and some of them fight him. They actually mm. go to war with him as well. And he has to deal with them, treat with them, control them one fashion or another. Um, and it also shows that many of the ones that are down there still have their souls somewhat attached. They're like lost souls. They're ghosts waiting to happen anyway. So yeah, it's a it's a whole fascinating place in terms of the, the, the overall impact that it has on the lore of what Warhammer is. Yeah, um, which... Yeah, there's this whole thing of that, like, sea monsters start to wake up that he did not mm. directly resurrect them. So they just go yeah. back to doing what they do normally, which is just <laughs> antagonizing things and trying to eat, even though they're not actually hungry. Or they're hungry, but nothing they eat fills them, so it's worse. Uh, and some of them actually start to leak out into the Great Ocean, where some of these things, through some bizarre means, escape intentionally or not. So all of a sudden, the old world starts seeing things like bone hydras and leech worms and these horrifying horrible undead creatures that don't like they're just sustaining themselves on the ocean's magic and they're horribly nightmarish creatures to come across how does arnest assault spite and sartosa view the galleon's graveyard uh so salt spite we get a lot of her in the novel um she's a main character in the novel for and she's awesome she's like if you if you're like i don't understand why salt spite got picked as legendary lord go read the short story it's not that long you can find an ebook copy for like five bucks uh, on the black library website it is phenomenal it's a lot of fun to read um and uh she her relationship is kind of complicated with it in that arnessa does not really like the undead uh but she considers herself a daughter of manon and she considers a lot of the undead to be kind of profane uh because they're kind of stealing manon's bounty in a sense uh, mm. but also she has a personal grudge with noctilus um, because she's had some issues with him and i mean he's the bloody reaver he attacks everybody on the sea and Sartosa, they're just terrified of them. Um, but as far as the Galleon's Graveyard, I imagine for them, it's like Davy Jones' Locker. Like, it's this kind yeah. of mythical afterlife of the sea that if you die at sea and you're not careful, that's where you're going. That. That's pretty much exactly what I was about to say. Hey, Jonathan. If the Great Maw consumes all it swallows, does that mean that the sea levels are falling in the Warhammer world? How long before it drinks them dry? I think we covered this earlier in the stream. The Great Maw uh, the, on the other side, so the Maelstrom, isn't exactly consuming all that water. Instead, it's sucking everything in as it goes down, and then it just lets it all flow back again, and then it sucks it all back down again. Yeah, um, it's uh, in great cycles. Yeah, it's Charybdis from the, the Odyssey. So it swallows a bunch of water to get everything that's in that water, and then it literally vomits all the water back out. 
um, without giving away any of the stuff it ate. So it's, it's basically filtering away at all the materia and yeah. allowing the water to go back free. Yeah, which is why uh, a lot when a lot of people see the maelstrom, it's usually not just a whirlpool. It's almost also a storm because there's so much water being gushed. And then it the turns into this great whirlpool that would make pirates <clears throat> in the Caribbean jealous. Yes, and uh, <laughs> if you're curious, yes, the epic final battle of Dreadfleet does happen in the Maelstrom of Skulls, and it's just as ridiculous it's round, as round, 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 round. It is and bonkers. <laughs> there's there's no wind per se, because you're just going round and round and round in circles, which is obviously silly, and anything that hits the middle, just dead. Automatically dead. No rules, no nothing, you're just dead. Yeah, well, yeah, but to be fair... <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> I, think, I think everybody but two characters dies uh, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the story, but uh, in any event... Um, the, is there any <laughs> that that is that is what we are talking about we're, that's sort of technical. what we're talking about right now we're being technical it's the other side but it's the it's the great butthole that takes stuff out and squirts it back out again yeah it's the great enema yeah <laughs> yay <laughs> so oh this stream yeah um <laughs> anyway uh it's a good thing we don't have sponsors um <laughs> <laughs> that, so uh, the Galleon's Graveyard, uh, Noctilus turns it into a dark magic hellhole. So it's like, wait, like, I would almost argue that it was probably a m far more, I don't know if peaceful is the right word, but kind of in a sense, peaceful place before he got there. Um, depending on how you view death in Shaiish. I, I imagine it's a place that's filled with Shaiish and probably quite a lot of Gur as well from all the things that have died, all the bones that are still there. There'd mm. be a fair amount of that kicking about. Plus, the maw itself is probably closely associated with birds. An enormous creature, god, all at yeah, once. That's true. Okay, so there's almost certainly a good chunk of that. And obviously the gyron that's running through the ocean, it's got all the ingredients for an enormous amount of dar and we've also got light magic down there because it is the physical manifestation of a god each one of the various winds has an excuse to be down there even to a degree once we've got ourselves noctilus arriving the bright wind so yeah we can see why dar would occur when it uh, gets all mixed up so other than the ogres uh thank you gun for bullets by the way for the super chat other than enormous ogres, does, anyone, appreciated. does anyone else worship the great maw not that specifically called out especially because the great maw only seems to respect people that eat and if you don't eat enough, it will genuinely punish you. Um, but I would not put it past humanity for someone to try. Um, yeah, I, I agree completely in that it's not a natural god for anyone but the ogres because it is, broadly speaking, an enormous manifestation of everything that the ogres are. So to best fit with that, you need to be an ogre with an ogre psyche. You need to think like an ogre, work like an ogre, be like an ogre. But as we all know, that doesn't stop certain people trying. I imagine there's some very foolish people who would attempt to do exactly that. Um, plus, there's one other detail that's worth adding and that's that the mo itself is to a degree sentient and it's definitely communicating we will get with into that in and around it so be aware that is something to consider just the prophet the good old mo himself yeah uh yeah though yeah and you, there are characters that proselytize the great ma like scribe slaughter mm -hmm. but there's actually a really hilarious ogre in i think volumes of the empire or, or archives of the empire volume two who is literally trying to like get humans in the empire to worship the great ma he's not successful at all uh but he's a oh, really happened. funny character if you want I'm, 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 I'm not can <laughs> here where it's so better like... here where it, here is much better that's how yeah I'm that's, that's, that, yeah, that's, that's the awesome. show noctilus puts on for the other members of the dread fleet that's how he, he gets uh -oh, them out. he's like uh -oh. we have we have a whole song and dance musical to welcome you in and they're all sitting there like jesus christ get us out of here <laughs> I need backup. And come back and down there's dead. We can't even die to escape this hell. <laughs> but um <laughs> well, what Andy said earlier is actually very interesting as well. Of that one of the things, and it's likely because of all the different winds. I actually wonder if the guy ran that's being drawn by the ocean itself plays so heavily into this, is that a lot of the people that wake up in the Galleon's graveyard are do not wake up because of Noctilus interfering. He finds mm. them already awake and yep. they are sentient and they're like doing their own thing. Um, mm -hmm. The most famous example or infamous of being Scratch Half Dead, who yep. is a Skaven that is hilarious because his little fleet, um, he had like this big, awesome warp lightning cannon ship with all these cool things, mm -hmm. and they got eaten by a big fish. <laughs> they got eaten by a fish named Scabrous, who is like a black leviathan um, or uh, something very similar. A big old angler looks like monster. a black leviathan. Yeah, they got they got eight, but they killed it from the inside because they just kept firing all their cannons because Skaven. 
Um, but then they were stuck and they sank to the bottom mm-hmm. of the sea and they all died. But they wake up in the giant's graveyard because of the magic there, and they immediately go about converting the giant fish corpse into their ship. And Noctilus finds them because <laughs> they start attacking everything around them. And so there's like warp lightning flying out, and Noctilus is like <laughs> sitting up in his castle going, What the hell is going on down there? Like, who's shooting fireworks in my graveyard? And so he wanders down there and he ends up treating with Scratch Half Dead. Um, mm-hmm. And he makes a deal with them. Like, a lot of people think that he could just like command them because he uh, awoke them, but he didn't. He, he bargains with all of the captains of the Dreadfleet. Yeah, there's a, an interesting point here um, concerning how they pitched it. They didn't do the classic, uh, they've all been woken up by Necromancer, Necromancer in control line. They almost did it like a fucked up version of what happened when they attempted to do the great ritual and summon up all the dead and bring them back as undead, the great ritual of Nagash. So it does sound very likely to me that he did a bastardized version of the ritual of Nagash, woke them all up expecting to control them and mm. didn't find them all underneath his control that it seems one... almost almost certain that he was using nagash's magic and that he much like most people who attempted to follow in nagash's footsteps failed he didn't manage to bind them to his will instead he just woke everything up that is actually a brilliant point i actually never considered that that makes a lot of sense hey squirtle squatty i'm 40 minutes behind being live but i see everyone donating and needing <laughs> you rock squirtle. Wow. When, when someone's like <laughs> when you catch up hey you kick ass you're, you yeah, guys you're, rock. thank you're, you you're Thanks sexy we wish you nothing but the best uh <laughs> on all your endeavors in life thank you for you are your brilliant. generosity <laughs> when you when you see this in 40 minutes <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> uh from 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 future for future slash past us um so what's interesting is yeah that actually makes so much sense because that would explain why noctilus doesn't like he's more of he's kind of the ruler of the galleon's graveyard but he rules over a land of kind of insanity where he does um, he's comfortable but he hasn't managed to fully get control of everything yet and granted, I, mean, I don't I think, think he really intends got, to. I think we've got a good reason for why it could fuck up as well. He might actually have had the correct ritual and all the necessary components in place, but this place is proper different. We're dealing with a realm that's not just physical, it's also immaterial. The mm. entirety of everything around the maelstrom is kind of broken in terms of your classic division between the uh, the, the aether and the material realm. So I think it's quite likely that the very nature of the place itself meant that his attempts to create what would have been his own kingdom of the undead under the water kind of failed. Yeah, that being said, he did pull off one really cool trick that's critical to his character which rabbit. is that <laughs> it would be all probably a horrifying undead rabbit knowing him but uh, i don't <laughs> i don't think that's quite it though i'm sure with you know watch he's like i could translate locate this whole castle but i can't get this fucking rabbit trick to work <laughs> <laughs> produce animal yeah but um oh man i need this is a complete aside but you just said that so it's funny and i have to just bring it up i had an ogre pc in my campaign that i'm doing on youtube that unfortunately is no longer playing with us because uh, schedule changes and he had to leave the campaign. Mm-hmm. But he, because he, he's playing an ogre, he had to deal with the rules of like he had the gluttony problem where you have to roll constantly to resist eating something, um, mm-hmm. which can, you know, obviously cause controversies. So the way he ended up getting around it because he was playing a butcher is he just took the produce small animal um spell so he just kept spam casting it to like pull out squirrels and rats that he would just eat constantly so he would just cast a spell reach into his pocket pull on animal stuff in his mouth immediately just endlessly that'll do a thing it's yeah. like oh good old rarit he was just as long as he didn't miscast he didn't care <laughs> anyway so what Noctilus did that's super duper important and why he became so terrifying was not necessarily that he controlled the graveyard, but that he bound himself to it. Yeah, so yeah, right. Noctilus basically set up kind of what we know Nagash can do, where if Nagash is destroyed, as long as the little tiny piece of him survives, though Noctilus is a little different, but as long as a little piece of him survives, it'll go back to his sarcophagus in the Black Pyramid or Nagash's Ark, depending on which... Ver- Usually, he goes back to the Black Pyramid, then he wakes up and he leaves and he goes to Nagash's Ark. Yeah. But uh, Tomb Kings are the same way. If a Tomb King gets destroyed, their body just goes back to their sarcophagus in uh, Nehekara, where it reforms. You have Definitely to destroy the sarcophagus. Crumbs. 
Yeah, definitely not Hillbillies. Not yeah. <laughs> definitely um, not. <laughs> we were here first, but they copied us. But exactly. uh, um, Noctilus has a similar thing where if Noctilus is killed or even his ship, the Bloody Reaver, is destroyed, it doesn't actually destroy him. It just sends him back to the Galleon's graveyard because that's yeah. where all the dead at sea go. And then he just gets back up because he's bound to it. Um, and basically the story tells that the only way to actually kill Noctilus is you have to kill him in the maelstrom itself. Um, which is why he gets really, really nervous when Captain Diego Roth follows him, follows him back to the galleon's graveyard. Cause that's the only place he's actually vulnerable. Cause if he dies there, he actually will get swallowed up by the maelstrom down into the maelstrom itself. And the God will consume him. Yeah. Which is what ends oh, up happening to him. But, uh, which is a very fitting and awesome death. Like, honestly, one of the coolest deaths in Warhammer Fantasy. I love the way Noctilus goes down. It's great. Um, but that is a very interesting aspect of, he, man, he really did copy the cash in a lot of ways. He yeah, wasn't as he successful, did. but he, he I, I think you'll find, though, that that's just as another small aside, and I'm aware of where we are at times. So we've got we're, we're doing good. We're doing good on time. Yeah, we're doing all right. Um, this is a, a classic example, I think, of what almost all necromancers do, which is get access to the books of Nagash, read the books of Nagash and go, wait a minute, I could rule my own giant undead kingdom. Fucking awesome. Give it a go. Fuck it up completely as the great ritual goes wrong. Awaken a bunch of undead that are now relatively semi-sentient and then attempt to try and control them after the fact and then possibly have Setra attack you with a gigantic club because you are definitely not in control of the undead that you attempted to control. So yeah, this is a classic example of what happens with necromancers. And it's just that same tale repeating again and again, which is quite fun. Thank you very much there, Genevil. Genevil? Nevil? Yes. Nevil? Thank you very, very much. It sounds like a great place for an underworld setting. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it does. And I think, um, I won't just say that. I think it makes um, a really good uh, one off adventure for like Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay or some other gigantic ritual to try and stop a thing by making your way over there. Somebody's died. You need to get access to their way shard, for example. And the only place to do it is to go to this place and count notes. list is there. And there's all sorts of fun adventures that you could do for a good yeah. four or five session run round. And uh, there, Nils, uh, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce your last name, Nils. I'm probably saying Nils uh, wrong. I'm calling you Andre. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll go with that. Have any Let's mad, go with that. Have, have any mad halflings ever worshipped the Maw? They like to eat, so some could go crazy. I think that could make an excellent basis for a character. So I agree completely. This was um when the uh, when i was planning out the contents for what became the book archives one um and we had both halflings and ogres in there and one of my development passes was going to be that adding in um how the maw is also deeply attractive to the soul of some halflings and how that manifests and should you ever decide to get yourself a character who hikes his way or her way halfway across the world and finds themselves in that area that that has implications and should definitely be explored because it's fun yeah um and th thank you so much there haven't that. there haven't been any established yet but that feels like a very natural evolution and i would actually think that the halflings and the feastmaster tribe may very well develop that relationship as well almost certainly i really like the idea of um a, the equivalent of halfling butchers um the equivalent of halflings who are completely caught over i uh, pardon me overcome by that that hunger that uh is in their character but manifests in slightly different ways they they often are stealing stuff they're eating stuff in a similar fashion they don't have the same wanderlust but they most certainly have their own hungers and passions their passions in particular so um exploring that and what a god that represents many of those passions would mean to them i think would be a very interesting story yep and uh, i do see a quick question i just want to address in the chat from uh adam here about can you just kill noctilus on land you have to remember that noctilus controls like one of the most powerful fleets in the world and his ship is literally the size of like an entire kingdom plus 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 because the bloody reaver just keeps accumulating every ship that attacks it into itself um and like making them operational again so it's like a horrifying amalgamation of all these different ships and things and he does not have to go on land like he literally has an entire army of thousands and thousands of undead on the bloody reaver alone not to mention the rest of his fleet so he can easily just show up and he sends his army out to do a bunch of raiding and pillaging and he sits on his castle he's not coming out 
Um, like the only time he leaves is if he needs to do something specifically, but he only does that like on islands or ship battles. Like he's not stupid. He he does not put himself in a scenario where he could die. Vampires tend to be very particular about vulnerabilities. Uh, and I, I think that's I, I think you've actually called out something possibly yes and it'd be a good way to get around that character should you be able to trick them into a particular place but i think there is one very important point to add to that he's a really fucking powerful vampire killing him on land is probably <clears throat> harder than killing him at sea and he's almost impossible to kill at sea anyway so the it'd be just easier firing giant cannons at him from far away which is why one easy way to kill him at sea so the answer is yeah probably and it's quite a good story that you could build from that i'm um, having flaws in your primary characters is what makes them interesting as you attempt to try and work at it as a puzzle if you are for example using it in a game but um i think the chances of that actually occurring are very low without specific circumstances yeah that being said yes i do think that would work it would just be really fucking hard to pull off because as andy said he is genuinely one of the most powerful vampires like ever and you totally um, know that someone would go and get his body afterwards and just throw it in the sea because that would that in itself would be a super cool story you know he got trapped on land for a hundred years or whatever and then gets dropped down into the ocean and then woof he's back again the very next day yeah good yeah. times um, but anyway, so uh, so that's kind of what the Galleon's Graveyard and all that is. So now we're going to kind of talk about the entity as a whole because it uh, introduces mm -hmm. some really interesting concepts of that. The Great Maw, as Andy kind of mentioned earlier, is something we need to touch on, is a sentient entity. Um, it, is. It, it is. It is aware. It can think. It can feel. Um, it knows when someone is standing at the edges of it. It knows when someone is trying to interact with it and it will interact back which is yep. super fucking scary hey omnicide given that the great maw is a god could it eat things in a metaphorical sense like if it was fed enough smiths could it eat the concept of forging stuff has it ever tried to eat another god i think it has tried to do anything that it can but you've got to remember that it is a material thing so it uh to eat another god it would almost certainly require a material god to jump in it and i don't think any god would be happy to do that <laughs> because it's just stupid um but could it eat things in a metaphorical sense i think it's um a manifestation of ogre inclinations and ogres have such a lack of imagination when it comes to the concept of metaphor they're very direct so i think the answer is conceptually it couldn't it just couldn't that's, yeah, that's quite a... beyond it it just consumes yeah, that's kind of under the situation of that's a very human way to look at it, but yeah, good it's question, not. Though. Yeah, it's not a human entity. That being said, yeah. remember that volcano god we talked about that's in the galleon's graveyard. It managed to kind of beach itself on one of the kind of islands of bones that exist in the galleon's graveyard. That's the only reason the Great Maw has not eaten it yet, hmm. is because it quite literally got stuck before it got swallowed up and. You know, if at any moment there could be something that happens that causes it to fall back in and then it would get eaten. But, yeah. but that's because there's a physical representation of it that would be devoured. Yeah, totally. Um, there's one massive difference between the Great Maw as a god and the vast majority of the entities in the warmer world that we think of as gods. And that's that it is quite physical it's material it is there it actually is there what it is is there of course it almost certainly has a soul a reflection in the aether much like ogres themselves do it's basically one gigantic ogre if you wish consuming and consuming and consuming but because of that it is bound by material laws it has a mind that works according to material laws it is quite literally sentient in a way that most gods are not because they're almost conceptual they're they're creatures of the aether a realm of emotion and extremes and and very different to the material realm where you have material laws working upon you that you must mm. work within meaning that yeah you can talk to it if you can figure out a way to do so yeah which is what one of the things that's so interesting about that is that means a lot of the gods one of the biggest downsides or of the gods or like weaknesses so to speak is that they don't really get how reality works many gods have a very very poor concept or understanding of time physics um and a lot of the things that we take for granted because it's just it's our reality those are the laws we we have a fundamental understanding of how they work a lot of the gods don't um yeah. which can cause them actually a significant number of issues 
um, when they're trying to interact with or tinker with the world because they might try to do something, but it just doesn't work that way. And reality will push back and be like, and will impose laws on the gods that are trying to manifest various things into reality, which is why like a lot of gods, a lot, one of the most popular questions I get when we talk about other gods is like, oh, does that god have greater demons or something similar? And it's like, it probably has agents that you would consider to be similar, but to manifest them in reality is super fucking hard because they have to obey the laws of reality in order to manifest unless there's a really, really weird specific circumstance happening. Yeah, to bluntly, there are a set of gods attempting to destroy reality. They are the chaos gods. The other gods are not trying to do this. The chaos gods are happy to break any laws that they can, and they find it tough. If it was easy, they'd be wandering the world themselves, just doing whatever they wanted, destroying whatever they wanted. They can't. They're separate from the material realm for a reason. And the the other gods who are not trying to destroy the world, they are, if anything, even more curbed because they're fitting within the material laws because it's in their best interest because they don't want to see the world destroyed, not to interact in that way. Yeah. Um, so anyway, back to the great ball as far as it. So as Andy said, it can think and talk and it can actually yeah. hold interesting conversations. We yeah. unfortunately don't ever get to see how it particularly uses its verbiage. But <laughs> one of the characters who has actually offered a lot of insight into this is Zhao Ming. Yep. Uh, Zhao Ming, the Iron Dragon of Grand Cathay, who is post up in Shenyang, which is kind of the last great bastion between Grand Cathay and the Great Maw, has been exposed to it and Warpstone for such mm -hmm. a long time that he has accidentally made a connection with the Great Maw. And it is in his head. And it's talking to him. And we don't know what it's saying to him. But it's it's probably whispering promises to be to be honest. It's probably saying, "Hey, man, like I, you are gluttonous and greedy for knowledge. You want to know things. You want to be able to change things and do all this stuff. Let me help you. Like, let me. Why don't you? Why don't we help each other? You know, we can help. You're this ancient, you know, dragon. Think of all the things you could eat. Think of all the things that you could consume." Let me work with you. And Zhao Ming, for the most part, has been rejecting it, but it's very heavily implied that his resistance is weakening with time. And that's not the only one. We also have um, Scrag the Slaughterer, who is constantly talking away with them all. Indeed, in some versions of this character, only speaks to them all, refuses to talk to anybody else at all. And Scrag the Slaughter is almost pretty much nowadays good old Maw that walks, prophet of the uh, devouring god, the Maw himself, uh, an exceedingly important character in terms of who the Maw is and how it reflects upon the material world. But he has a prophet that he's directly talking to and assuming that Scrag isn't insane and assuming that Zhao Ming's not insane as well, <laughs> that um, that God is directly influencing the material realm through one of its agents and not, not in a distant way, not in a sort of, oh, my son, you go in that direction and I'll just watch you do shit. Literally talking to him daily, all yeah. the time, all the time. And let's be honest, Greg is proper mental, no hands, big <laughs> huge blades there, dragging a massive cauldron full of all the worst shit in it. Um, yep. He's a proper lunatic, um, but quite different to the original. I think I mentioned right at the very beginning of the stream, he's a very old character. He was kicking around since the 80s in terms of the character himself. But back then, he was a worshipper of Malal, um, and he was working against other chaos worshippers, as most worshippers of Malal were. And he got completely repurposed um, for, the, I think, 6th edition of the army list and um turned into a prophet mm -hmm. of the maw instead um and malal obviously has issues so malal was taken away replaced with the maw and in terms of understanding the maw we have a clear example of a character who is directly talking to a material physical god on a daily basis and is uh almost himself an entity of pure hunger and it speaks to what that god is like as well. It's not just the ogres think the god is like this. The god is definitely, 100%ly, that. And that is one of the reasons why other species would find it particularly difficult to engage with. Because really, it's got such a heavily ogre mindset in terms of how it does everything that anyone else attempting to interact with it would find it almost alien, impossible to understand, or 
comprehend in terms of how it was attempted to communicate, which makes Xiao Ming in general a super interesting character because it's something that's lasted for a long time. And now Xiao Ming is understanding it's getting to it. That, uh... That really yeah. does suggest that something's going to happen there, which is super fun. And it's a shame it didn't happen in the end times. Yeah, well, and it, it's, I really enjoy some of the writing. So it's not in the actual Total War game, but it's, well, it, it, well actually it is. But Zhao Ming is very weirdly synergetic with the ogres. Like he's starting to understand them at such a fundamental level that he actually finds them very entertaining to be around. And they find him interesting to be around. Mm. To the point that uh, Zhao Ming has formed a genuine relationship with Grisus Goldtooth, which is very unusual. Like, Grisus is normally, a, he's a tyrant. Even among yeah. ogres, he's a tyrant. But he yeah. considers Zhao Ming like a, a brother, almost like a brother-like entity, where there's a there's a hilarious quote from, I'm assuming it's from the Cathayan Army book, because it's written as if it's from, like, an actual publication, but obviously it isn't. But there's a note on one of the articles they did for Zhao Ming where there's, a conversation between Zhao Ming and Grease's gold tooth where Zhao Ming says something along the lines of it's they're having a conversation and Zhao Ming responds to Grease's apparently asked Zhao Ming something along the lines of why don't like apparently Zhao Ming was um uh what's the venting about his his parental issues his issues with his father and Grease <laughs> says something along issues. Grease says something along the lines of, well, why don't you just eat your dad like I did? That, like, that solved all my problems. And Zhao Ming responds, like, he laughs. Him and Grease are laughing about it. And he says something along the lines that, even if I, even if I, like, I understand that you and I have similar problems with our fathers. But unfortunately for me, my father is far larger in comparison to me than yours was to you. So I don't think I could get him down. And Greece is kind of like, oh, well, that's a shame. <laughs> like, But they have this very camaraderie relationship. And it seems that it's only, it could likely be because the Ma is changing Zhao Ming in a way where he is becoming more ogre-like um, in a lot of his personality, which might explain why he's far more likely to interact with humans and ogres. And the other dragon kids are like, he's clearly gone fucking insane, which to be fair, <laughs> but but there's a really I also interesting think, thing there. Yeah, I agree completely. And I think there's also potentially an interesting aspect to the Maw that we shouldn't forget because it's very easy to just view it as exactly what it is, a giant mouth that consumes. But the ogre personality is to blend, to mix, and to work with others. Wherever they go to other civilizations, they just fit in. So, for example, an ogre that arrives in the empire will become an imperial ogre will often wear imperial clothes will try to fit in with the empire obviously they still have their own cultural norms that they kind of find it difficult to get away from but they will fit in if they go over to nippon you'll find yourself ninja yeah and indeed, there is a model for it, ogres okay if you get yourself um, one that pops over and joins a pirate ship you'll get yourself a pirate ogre as the various man eaters and various other ogres are wandering around the world they take on the traits of those around them and to a degree that i think that that may speak of particularly interesting aspects of what the maw could have become if it was exposed to something more and Zhao Ming, i think is potentially fascinating perhaps one of the reasons why the maw talks more is because of its proximity to something that's talking back yeah and, and uh, in turn could become more sentient and develop more traits purely because of those interactions it is after all in terms of its character nothing more than a giant ogre yeah and uh, hawk i'm sure you're very proud of that uh, <laughs> but um What's interesting, going back to Scrag, <laughs> is I actually really like the way he's interpreted in Total War with his diplomacy lines. And that Scrag never talks to anybody else. Like, he never has a two-sided conversation. He's only ever talking to the Maw. And when you're ever, whenever Scrag is giving, like, a, uh, he's giving, like, a speech or something in his quest battles, but especially in diplomacy, he's always having an immediate conversation with the Maw where he's like, do I eat this one? No, we don't eat this one? Okay, I won't eat this one. And, like, that's the ma seems to literally be giving him play by plays where most prophets in the warhammer world have to have visions or like this interpretation really, is hard <laughs> yeah like trying to figure out what your god is saying to you is really fucking difficult like even when you're dealing with like our ulric or the grand theogenist or mm -hmm. like the the ever queen of aisha like a lot of them can really struggle to figure out what the fuck their gods want 
Um, but not Scrag. Scrag is literally able to go, hey, do you want me to do X? And the grandma goes, yes. And he goes, okay, cool. Or he'll wake up and the grandma says, hey, today you need to go 20 miles this way, then 15 miles this way, and there's going to be a fight where I want you to go eat. And he goes, all right. And he leads all of his gorgers and buddies and stuff <laughs> to that place. <laughs> Which, like, all kind gorgers. of shows the great ma is is a lot smarter than you would think. Yeah, um, uh, uh, cunning might be a better word than cunning. smart. Yeah, cunning is, yeah, per se, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the, you can see why it got attached to Gorka Morka. Um, it's it's most certainly not what many uh, outsiders would perceive it to be, and I think that's something that we need to keep in mind when we're thinking of how the Maw is represented on the world. Now, you could argue that Scrag is just crazy and he's hearing voices and it has nothing to do with the Maw. But I think that if you look at the overall background of the Maw, the fact that it is completely different to other gods and however you want to interpret that term, it makes sense. The whole creation of the Maw, how it became into a being, how it destroyed all of those ogres, consumed them and effectively became them one giant mouth it consumes. It's basically one gigantic ogre in some respects sitting down there, the ogre god. And seeing how that has developed into something that appears to be quite sentient and working through individuals is, I think, fascinating and something I would be very keen not to say is just craziness or madness because it makes it unique interesting and something that in terms of the warhammer background as a whole much more fun to play with so yeah it's mm -hmm. awesome and you know something that dreadfleet doesn't at all ever touch upon because it's never noxilus never talks and we never get to see from his perspective it's always from captain diego ross perspective um but one of the things that's really interesting to think about as well with noctilus is that I don't actually, I actually think it's likely if you were to look at the lore now and have someone sit down and kind of pull all the pieces together, that Noctilus, like Zhao Ming, may have formed a relationship with the Maw, especially a vampire. What, what a perfect creature of consumption. Yeah. It, drinks blood. it eats in a, in the similar sense, just in a new way. And I would think it would make perfect sense that the Maw, especially Noctilus was there for 10 years. Like yeah. he had time to literally, like and he, that found himself to it where it resurrects him unless he dies in a very specific way where you know then he just becomes part of the process which you know hey fair game but i actually think there would be a lot of evidence to suggest that noctilus may be very similar to scrag in yeah, some unusual I agree. ways yeah i really like that i think that merges the details we have of the background of the individual characters of the god in question and in no way contradicts any of the various character beats that they take it makes sense i like it let's just make it so <laughs> yeah which i think ties so nicely into spooktober in that the great ma in many ways is kind of the most dangerous god on the planet because he it plays by such it. a unique set of rules and it seems to be very and the other thing that's very dangerous about it is that the primary thing that defines it is bottomless hunger, endless hunger. Like, I don't think the Ma is one of the gods that would look at the world and be like, oh, well, no, I need to preserve this. I don't think it would have the capacity to resist devouring everything. It's basically the physical manifestation of capitalism. Throwing things in and it just keeps eating it. What's happening? Yep. <laughs> We're not getting anything. The eternal back. consumption of profit. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah, I like that. Uh, which I you know, it's like uh, you know, the end times happened with the did, but it's like I uh if you wanted to do like a really interesting um lore uh exercise, brainstorm exercise, or a wolf rep campaign exercise, having the great maw as a primary antagonist trying to pull on like a great devouring um is genuinely fascinating in that you would be dealing with ogres vampires uh the dread fleet so like and if if it is able to talk to noctilus which i think it can because noctilus he shows up in such bizarre places without explanation and he's not and he's always showing up to prevent something that could threaten him or the maelstrom something that could prevent his endless killing his endless feeding to the maelstrom mm -hmm. to make it stronger like he shows up the whole reason for anyone that doesn't know what's going on with Dreadfleet, the only reason the Dreadfleet event happens is because Noctilus kills Captain Diego Roth's father. And the reason Noctilus kills him is because he invents this really clever little compass thing 
and that allows him to basically track more slip, which is bonkers. Um, but, and it drives him mad. It drives him completely mad inventing this thing, which it should. Um, uh, but he invents a device that could track more slip, which plays into finding the gateway into the galleon's graveyard. The uh, more slip is a very key component. The it chaos is. moon, which makes sense a lot, it makes no, a lot of sense. Of when you consider how much the moon ties into the ocean, and also the Great Maw is a giant piece of warp stone, so it's a warp stone moon that ties into the gateway. Yada yada, makes a lot of sense. I actually really like that piece of lore writing. But uh, Noctilus knew the instant Yego Roth's father finished that device because something warned him, and he went. He said, I'm I'm sold. I love it. He's basically also a priest of the Maw. Let's just leave it at that. Love yeah, it. The, yeah, the moon dial of Anigio Roth, the map right of Talea, who ran away yeah. to Sartosa because mind crazy yeah, shit. I, 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 yeah, I love that. I think that's a really nice development and it makes sense. Yeah, if I was writing it, I'd definitely lean into that. That's awesome. But um, I think it is time to do some uh, questions. Questions. Oh, before we do, on the side. Hey, on the side, sprinted out of my shower to give you a mental image of capitalist ogre railway barons wearing top hats and monocles shaped like the mall. Little Listen, toothy you monocles. Cannot, you cannot tell me with a straight face that there is not an ogre somewhere in the Empire who wears mo <laughs> a monocle and top hat. There is an ogre like that somewhere <laughs> in the world. Ah, a little more. Oh, thanks very much on the side. I appreciate that. That's a, a mental monocle. image I'm going to keep. <laughs> a monocle. Ah! It's a monocle, but it's got little teeth in it. <laughs> a monocle. Oh, oh, oh it's my beautiful. God. I okay, let's go to our questions. All right. Um, so, oh, wow. There are a lot of them. Okay. Oh, wow. Uh, okay, let's run through them quickly then. All right. I so, won't do my norm and just wax lyrical. I'll just say yes uh, or no. Don't don't lie to my face, Andy. <laughs> I'll try not <laughs> to. <Unbecoming>. <laughs> <laughs> uh so first up, uh, we have questions from Jiggy. So Jiggy asks, uh, let's see, can you fly <laughs> inside the Great Maw? Or would it have some kind of suction on it? Like once you get inside, you have no hope of escaping. Uh it I would say it could breathe in. Right, um, so um, all big holes suck air down into them. That's the nature of them. Indeed, it's a it's a massive problem for some of the huge mines that they've got. Um, and, and I'm desperately trying not to make this what it sounds like. But enormous open cast mines cause problems for aircraft as they go over them and they get sucked right down inside them. So, um, <laughs> yes, the maw is going to suck them down. Um, but the maw itself is a living, breathing entity. Breathing, I mean, it doesn't have organs. It almost certainly has a belly of some sort, but it's probably a thuric, yeah. which means it's infinite. It has an infinite belly because it's a freaking ogre. Um, it's, its hunger is never satiated. So, um, if you fly over it, you're probably going to get sucked down just by the nature of physics. But you've also got to realize that it probably goes down for an almost infinite length with a, a constant need for everything to go down there too. So spiritually, you'll get sucked down. F by the laws of physics, you'll get sucked down. And by the need of the god itself, you'll get sucked down. So basically, it's super dangerous. I imagine Does you could get out. I imagine there's things, but I wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> Sucks so good, it's spiritual. <laughs> uh does the great wall ma eat the winds of magic oh i would say it definitely does it yeah definitely, sure. i would say draws the winds of magic into itself if it's physical it'll eat it and the winds of magic are in the material plane and they are physical and they can be they change things in the material plane and they are themselves changed by the material plane the answer is yes yeah i would say that actually is what probably prevents the warpstone desert from getting any larger is that the great maw is constantly drawing all of that warpstone dust and a lot of that irradiated stuff into itself instead of it just constantly eating outwards yeah, I can imagine throughout the entirety of that area, there's a lot of the equivalent of like dragon black lines and way lines and all the rest of it just yep. heading Which into... Which actually could be, could be really fun if you ever had a campaign in that area of your wizards really struggling to control their magic because yeah, of how the winds are like... And it's pooing past them. Like, I, there's lots of fun details you could add with that. Total yeah, fireball right. and it just suddenly curves <laughs> hits one of your party members. <laughs> um, what a shame. <laughs> Elric, how could you? <laughs> So Wit Wittgendorf all over again. Um, <laughs> can the Gra Galleon's Graveyard eat a Black Ark? Oh, uh, so the Galleon's Graveyard is like a nation-sized area. It is huge. It's like a yeah. giant swath of the ocean. Um, I will say, the reason Dreadfleet failed as a, as a game is not because they had bad game design. It's because yeah. the Black Ark was not part of the Dreadfleet, which is bullshit. 
He got a Tomb King to join him, but he couldn't get a Dark Elf to join him. <sighs> Bullshit. I hate that so I like I don't know who wrote it, but whoever wrote a nation of giant ship battle game and did not have the a most black card. giant ship in the game was an idiot. <laughs> I remember my abject Ugh. disappointment when um, my box arrived because I had, had a black art it. tabletop mini and they yeah, just and didn't do it. I was pulling out the little models and I was looking at the captains and then I went over and I went, that's them all. Where's my dark elf? Yeah. Oh. We got a we got a like a we got a high elf dragon ship. Cool. And we got a we got a we got just a no. Yeah, dumb. Like I honestly, as much as I do love him, I would have happily traded. Mm, I probably would have traded the uh, the Tomb King for a Dark Elf because the the Tomb King was a oh, weird, the, he was yeah, a weird character. But he, but the actual ship was cool as fuck. It was well, all <laughs> of them were cool as fuck. Though. Like <laughs> yeah, all of them were cool as fuck. True. I don't. They all they all had great. You know what? They should have just done yeah, two yeah. more ships. There should have just been two more ships. One more yeah, for each team. Totally. You know, give us a. There should have been a Bretonian ship, and there should have been a uh, uh, a uh, Dark Elf ship. Yeah, good. Totally. Call it. Because Bretonians have an awesome navy. A lot of people don't think they do, but their navy is actually incredible. Um, anyway, um, is Greece's is Mamba's? Uh, that's a thank you for the your mama joke. I'm going to skip that because we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> if if it goes to the planet, how would that work with the core? Is the Warhammer world hollow? So the uh, no, um, and it almost certainly doesn't go through the core. It almost certainly moves through the aether. Um, the reality itself is broken down in the center of it because the enormous amount of warp stone. Indeed, it was probably birthed from the warp stone itself. Um, it has broken the rules of the mortal realms. Basically, it is an mm. entity um, that is also on the in the divine realm. So, its bottomless belly lies there, and its maw has eaten all the way through. It's a complicated metaphysical situation, but uh, when you come to pure reality itself. Yeah, no, it hasn't eaten through the core. Yeah, and there and there's also no guarantee that it ate straight down. It may have taken yeah. like the path of least resistance, which could have led to weird things. And we do actually see, granted, whether or not you care about this is up to you, pers uh, up to every individual. But the core of the Warhammer world plays very critically into Age of Sigmar, um, which is malice. The it's like a big sphere of like pure magic gold. Uh, but it is like the literal core of the Warhammer Fantasy planet. Uh, in the Total War Warhammer universe, the Mountains of Morn is covered in truly massive elephantine bones. Is this true to the main line? And if so, what are they? Shouldn't you be shouting all of that? <laughs> I like I like being able to use my voice for the rest of the day, Andy. Thank you. <laughs> um, I would say, yeah, there are absolutely gigantic titanic creatures that died there, especially the Mountains of Morn. The mount Mountains of Morn yeah. have megafauna out the ass. Um, I, what are they? I don't know, but they're big. <laughs> they're probably like giant mammoth creatures or giant, like just imagine horrifying, super massive mammal like creatures or reptiles. And it's probably relatively accurate. Just say thanks for that. Um, appreciated. And Josh adds in Chuck Gotrek at the Moy finally gets his wish. I strongly recommend you go watch our Slayer um, discussion. He would not get his wish if he jumped in the mall. Yeah, no, that would not. Unless, unless he somehow managed to kill it, which it's fucking then, Gotrek. Though. That would be fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Giving it a good go. I'll take it. I'll, oh, I'll, love it. Oh my die! God. Yeah, I, uh, I wouldn't put it past him, but yeah, probably, he, yeah, I don't think he would agree to do that. He would just see that as suicide. Uh, let's see. Uh, John T. Scarecrow, the great... Uh, okay, we've already answered that. Thank you for the question, though. Uh, Porpoise, is there any chance the Great Maws played an influence upon the fish people or cultures within its domain? If I wrote the fish people, 100% yes. Yes. Um, it would be, if you were writing the fish people or whatever they were called, if you didn't include them all in that, you are wasting a gigantic opportunity. Yeah. Tren trench dwellers, abyss, ch chasm dwellers, abyssians, whatever you want to call them. Um, yeah. I just I just say fish people because whenever they're referred to in Warhammer, they're always called fish fishmen or fish people for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Though in Age of Sigmar, they have an official name. They're called the Chasm Dwellers in Age of Sigmar, but they're still yeah, kind of know. mystical weirdness. They haven't officially they have a name, but we haven't gotten too much on them. Uh, do the Celestial Dragon Children know why? I, uh, no, I'm sure the Celestial Dragon Children knew about the Great Maw instantly. They could. There's no way they could not have known. Yeah. Um, and knowing the I, I think. Dragon 
it oh, would almost certainly be possibly one of the reasons why Cathay became Grand Cathay, um, because it's another enormous danger sitting right on the borders of the lands that they control. Because um, as we've said before, there is definitely something odd with Cathay's timeline and exactly where does Grand Cathay become Grand Cathay rather than just what had been ruled by them for some time before already. Mm. So um, you could use this as a strong excuse for them moving from one type of empire to another. Yeah, I would also imagine that Andy's theory is probably very, very correct in that Cathay was preparing a lot of magical defenses before the meteor hit. Um, I would not be shocked if he was like, okay, the wishing compass is going to point this way and we're going to direct all our magic towards it. And also every single child, because they're all powerful wizards, everybody shows up and everybody's going to help put up a barrier. Um, because possibly the, yeah. the reason behind building some of their most important artifacts and uh, locations. So yeah, there's a, a lot that you could tie for Grand Cathay into this. Um, and if we're if we were writing the army list, it would most certainly be one of those key little paragraph blocks that you would include the yeah. formation of the Maw and how it came about and the massive and enduring effect that would have had lasting result uh, on the. Grand Cathay and Empire. Uh, awesome Lion Saurus. It does some biddlies. Let me grab that comment. Where the oh, I missed that one. Heck? There it is. Let me just find um, it. You got it. Not sure if allowed to ask Total War. Yeah, no, you can ask Total War stuff. I'm going to try it anyway. If not, enjoy the free bits. What would Sotek and then Andy like to see added to Total War in the future? Okay, that is a very broad question that doesn't really have ah, a big one. But uh, uh, just to make it super easy, uh, I already made a video on Araby. I want Araby. Give me Araby. Araby would be awesome, wouldn't it? It would. It would. Yeah. Araby would be awesome. <clears throat> is that what I'd want? As you're looking through the other questions, I'm oh. going to mull what I'd want while okay, you're looking through fine. the other questions. I'll come back to you. Uh, John Locke Cole, would I say the arrival of the Great Wild marked the beginning of the end of the world that was? Or in short, or in short, would you say that that's when it was all ogre now? <laughs> I thought that was actually a genuine, <laughs> interesting question, and then it turned out not to be. <laughs> Um, I'd say that the answer to that is no, because the Great Maw has no particular interest in ending the world, because then it would have to stop eating. Yeah, um, I would, I, indeed. I would, I would argue that Age of Sigmar, to a degree, shows that it was not in the best interests of the Maw. Yeah, what's um, funny? To have the world come to an end. What's funny is because of the fact the Great Maw exists within the Materium and the Ether, but it, it's far more within the Materium. I would actually wonder if the Great Maw looks at the Chaos Gods as potentially an endless feast. Um, and like in that it might be a more opposed to chaos because it looks at them and goes, I can eat that and it would never end. I could just eat that forever, which is a because like ogres have so, a very interesting relationship with chaos. It's not necessarily negative, but they do like fighting them a lot. The challenge stone is there for a reason. Yeah, there's something in that. Uh, what's next? As Islington, will you and Andy sing the ogre song? Not today. Maybe one day in the distant future. <laughs> Do you know the ogre song? I don't know the ogre song. What's the ogre oh, song? We'll, we'll have to end the stream with that. Uh, when they when they release the release trailer for the ogre kingdoms, it's a full CG trailer that has a song. Interesting. Is it the ogre singing it? Yeah, the ogres are singing. That's fascinating because um, the army list particularly calls out that they don't sing. Yeah, no, they're yeah they're That's having a... really interesting. Um, the army the army list particularly calls out culturally they don't understand singing. They think it's a waste of time. Culturally, ogres bellow and shout and scream. Um, and what arriving at a feast is like arriving at a cacophony. I will say, but they it... consider that to be say they consider that singing. Um, and it's their it singing is like. It is, but does it it's... involve any words? If it does, then yeah. it's not okay, what the yes. ogres do. <laughs> yes, <laughs> or at least it's not what the ogres do in the army list. There is different yeah. iterations that will obviously do different. Yeah, things. we we'll we'll end the stream with that. We we will watch that at the end. Um, uh, more seriously, people hear the whispers of the maw. Is it? Yes, we've talked about. Yes, uh, it's sentience. What are its goals? To eat. Yep. To eat and in some ways to learn. Like and to get like others to consume as well, because the bigger yeah. they get, the bigger they'll be when it eventually arrives at them, and, they, and it can eat it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, we got a super chat here from Sam. 
Uh, if all the ogres suddenly disappear for whatever reason, what would become of the maw since the reflection of the ogres themselves kind of... Ah, it, it could... It, it would just continue, I think. Um, yeah. uh, th one of the great mistakes of many who view Warhammer is thinking that the gods are somehow intrinsically yeah. linked and only survive because of certain individuals. Particularly for a manifested material creature, that is not the case. This, this thing will continue no matter what happens to the ogres. It's not going to stop. Yeah, if anything, eat. it might get hungrier, but that just might make it start to reach out far more aggressively. Um, yeah. Which would probably have some really weird and dangerous ramifications. I really wish they'd done something with it in the end times because it's such a fascinating location stroke thing. Yeah, well, that's what happens when you get an end times that's literally focused on about 10% of the entire planet. <laughs> fucking Agree. Yeah, well, we've discussed that before in the past. Yeah, uh, insane. Is it possible to go inside the Great Maw and come out in the Galleon's graveyard? I, possible is a bit of an extreme word in Warhammer Fantasy because a lot of yeah, weird it's possible. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I would say yes with a huge amount of salt. <laughs> yeah. And I agree with that entirely. Um, I also think it'd be quite possible to go down into the Maw and potentially survive. And as we've discussed earlier, all sorts of things could be down there living. Things that they themselves are perhaps a part of the Maw in some respects. Um, it's an adventure waiting to happen. It's a location that has been sorely misused. Oh, yeah. in terms Man, of the Great Maw would be like, pardon me. That would Just, be like an excellent oh, like, like, Cthulhu-type dungeon. Or like, oh, yeah. like, like if anyone's played Darkest Dungeon, like that level of fuckery. Of where yeah, it's and, just it's awful. It's and just then get, awful. And it's a perfect location as well for getting down there and finding it's not what you expect. Um, because mm -hmm. that, if anything, just makes everything a bit more <gasps> Yeah, who knows? Maybe there's a whole civilization of like parasite creatures that live down there. When Hello, wild. How are you today? Um, yeah. I've got me got me monocle on. Hello, <laughs> and me top hat. <laughs> Good yes, to see of, you down here. James Workshop's like, let's make a British parasites. British, yeah, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> because James Workshop, everyone's British. Everyone's British. Uh, let's see. That's still my favorite piece of whenever someone learns about Warhammer. Ah, oh, so the empires like they use German words and they're kind of loosely based on like Germanic stuff. So they speak German. No, no. <laughs> they, they use German words, but they do speak English and they have British accents. I don't know why they just do. And, and they use German words badly. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Someone taught them German and didn't do a great job of it. And we don't know who's responsible for this. <laughs> anyway, um, Hawk Oddly, uh, if the Galleon's Graveyard and the Great Maw are a single connected entity, does that mean the Warpstone Meteor that caused it is still out there? And if so, would it have to be massive enough to have a cortex to have made a tunnel through the planet? What do you think would happen if it struck a get? Oh, so I guess he's asking, do we think it burrowed all the way through planet and emerged and went back out into space and might loop back around? I don't think so. I think it nope. transformed. Um, in fact, we're pretty, um, the background on it is relatively firm on this. The uh, other side came later and it ate its way through the world. It's not that they warped the meteorite blasted through and left a big long channel. What happened was, boom, it hit, it fragmented into thousands of pieces. The maw, that big huge consumption of all the ogres, was born out of this and it ate downwards and around and through the aether because of all the warp stone that was down there um and it burst out the other side of the world a couple of years afterwards um it was much like most ogres single-minded it probably went as direct a route as it could consider one line but when you're dealing with something that's etheric that one line doesn't mean a single straight direction it means it came out the other side of the planet because conceptually that's what happens but who knows what lies in between so that warp stone is to a degree gone or fragmented all around the desert on that side. On the other side, it's not a warp stone driven um, environment. It's a, a, an environment driven by the dead as everything gets sucked in. It's very different on the other side. Mm. But don't view the other side as being the same as what's happening beside Grand Cathay. It's not. It's quite different. Yeah. Um, Half Crown, does anything live around the Maelstrom is the, or is there too much Shyish around? There is nothing living in the Galleon's Graveyard. It is a realm of death. You it, Unless you use a particular ritual, you have to be dead to be pulled in. I think, um, uh, not to contradict, because I that's 100% correct, um, but I think that there's also uh, more than enough story potential for something to have gone down there, found a way in, to have ensconced itself in one of the many okay. weird holes, places. Holes there. show up. So, like, yeah. it is very... I'm going to rephrase that. 
someone has probably stumbled into it by accident. Ships have probably found their way in on accident. Yeah. Um, creatures that were eaten by a bigger creature that then died might have survived in its guts until they arrived there and then wandered out. It's there are not a lot of them, but that you know, yeah, like, lo lo lots of crazy shit happens in the Warhammer world all the time. So the general rule is everything is dead down there. It is a realm of what many consider to be effectively pure evil and wrongness and weirdness and bad. But as we all know, that means that somebody must have come back to tell the story, which means people have been down there. Yeah, somebody drew a map of it. Hmm? Someone, someone drew literally drew a map <laughs> of, the, of the Galleon's graveyard. Um, there actually is a really fun series of shenanigans in Warhammer that implies the gods themselves deeply desire cartographers because there's even a, there's a guy whose literal whole storyline is the dark, dark gods let him into the realm of chaos so he could map everything out and then let him leave. And they didn't fuck with him at all. Like they didn't mutate him. They didn't make him go crazy. They were just like, hey, could you like do all this? Cartographers and like, rock. It's well yeah, known. Yeah, yeah. Even the dark gods are like, don't, don't fuck with a cartographer. Leave him alone. <laughs> I think he got burned at the stake when he got back. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, what do we think the Great Ma is telling Zhao Ming? Honestly, I think it's encouraging him to engage in certain forms of consumption. Um, maybe eating Warpstone. Yeah, I think the whatever it is, it will dive. It will almost certainly be at the core concept of what it is, and that is consumption now it's possible that it's gained some more intellect over time because of the very nature of the things it's talking to so perhaps that conscious that consumption is more refined than you'd expect but i doubt it i imagine at heart it will be consumption it will be yeah. wanting um him to basically eat the bigger thing dad for example yeah i would i would heavily suspect it is will, consciously or not is likely preying upon his insecurities relating to his father Yep. Especially because of how emotional he seems to tell it to get out of his head. I, yeah, I suspect it has a lot to do with dad. Yep. Uh, Maharaja of End. Is the Great Maud truly a god, like in the sense of the gods of the old world, a physical entity or something in between? Uh, we kind of talked about it. It's, it's something, it's more between. of something in between. Yeah. It's a complicated uh, entity. Um, Hakali, if ogres realized the Gallon's graveyard, do you think they'd try and take it over? Oh, I think they would set sail. You would have full on ogre ships being like, We're gonna go find them all, and they're they're gone. And they're gone, yeah. And it wouldn't surprise me if that has occurred several times over the course of the last so many thousand years. Um, there will have been a prophet of them all that um, went marching off to sea at some point. There will have been entire uh tribes that thought that this was the answer very possibly if we ever got fish men there might be a bunch of fish ogres sitting down there worshiping them all <laughs> on the outside it's the sort of yeah. shit that you would do if you're making this up and you've seen some of the crazy crap that's sitting inside the ogre army list for goodness sake that one consumes fire literally drinks magma and somehow survives trust me if the ogres can eat their way down there they'll figure out a way to do it yeah uh, let's see. How connected is Stromfels to the Maelstrom? That is actually a uh, that's actually a super interesting thing. So Total War actually goes really far to suggest that the Maelstrom and Stromfels have a very very deep relationship. Interesting. Um, not not necessarily that they're the same thing, but Stromfels is full on painted in Total War as being the patron god of the Vampire Coast, which as the god of pirates is actually not crazy at all. Not crazy, um, and that many of the vampire coast um acknowledge him and it even goes so far as to say the lore of the deeps which the lore of the deeps is more accurately like kind of the magic that noctilus uses so the magic he gets from the so. maelstrom I, um, I was looking over it as a list and it's very it's necromancy i suppose yeah well yeah it's it's water necromancy functionally yeah, but what's very totally. interesting about it is that solostra dearfon who is the original character is the most powerful caster of it and she is functionally a prophetess of Stromfels because Stromfels is the one that resurrected her. And he's also the one that taught her, which I think there could actually be a very, because we actually don't know a lot about Stromfels before like the rise of the empire. It could very well be. There is more of a connection than people think between Stromfels and the, the maelstrom, because what is a shark? If not a great devourer. Yeah. Although I think that's uh in many respects uh an unfair characterization of sharks that's almost what's the metaphor of a shark because everyone perceives them as that that's but true, they're no but more I, I a devourer think... than any animal yeah i don't um, think stromfels is like 
sharks in the sense of truly understanding what sharks are. I think humans attribute sharks to Stromfels because they're scared of them and they eat. Yeah, I think there's definitely something in that. I think uh, I think there's definitely something in that. Uh, it's something that you want to plumb into. Yeah, that being um, said, I don't I don't necessarily think the maelstrom. Up. I don't think the maelstrom necessarily is Stromfels, but I think there is a very strong relationship between the two so of them. This is a really good question, Dreamy Robot. Will there be an episode discussing the changes or perhaps lore expansions made by Total War? Yes, um, we've been discussing this between ourselves a couple of times because obviously I don't know that particular aspect of the lore very much. I've read bits, I've done bits. I'm going to be playing the game whenever my new PC arrives um so i'm aware of it loosely but not really deeply and discussing some of the major differences i think will be a fascinating conversation yeah that is that is something we will do in the future um october is going to be spooky month so we're going to be talking about spook spook spooky subjects so not this month but some point in the future and bring up on the side again thank you uh Skag <laughs> <laughs> this is most orders everywhere pop off Set we're getting sales. seafood <laughs> boys let's go <laughs> Did you see, uh, could you imagine that like some writer does the whole like Moses parting the sea, but it's scrag so they can walk to the, <laughs> the maelstrom. He's like, we're going to dinner. <laughs> part the sea. Um, um, um. <laughs> we're going to drink our way there. Let's go. There is um, a stupid story in there. There's somewhere. a really funny, stupid story. You know, um, a myth <laughs> from, um, um, uh, mythology involving like Thor and Loki and all of them that I always thought would be really funny for an ogre is the whole thing of the trials of Loki, not Loki the god Loki, Loki the giant Loki, where Thor drinks a good portion of the ocean, the sea level like noticeably goes down. That would be a hilarious story involving an ogre involving also, a god. Like the idea of, a, of an ogre that just walks off into the water and <laughs> is never seen again. He just strides out into the ocean um, and just swims. And nobody knows what happens um, to that ogre. In fact, that being the case, the more you think about it, the more you think that I would definitely have at least a few ogres down there doing something. Some that I'd, over the course of time got down there, but maybe some undead ones, maybe something else, but you definitely all, something. Well, yeah, you think about how like powerful some the fire get are, there. but there's like there's not that many of them. Like they're a yeah. very small little tribe. I would be, uh -huh. I, I would think it would be dumb if you ever did like an RPG exploration of the Galleon's graveyard and did not have an ogre tribe that had found their way there because some would have found their way there it is their god and and the god is them as well i just can't see it not happening uh all right did anyone survive dreadfleet after the galleon's graveyard incident um the dread so when the dreadfleet was destroyed there were survivors very very few um rns assault spite survived uh but that's because she is a mutant that originally was born as kind of like a mermaid because of her mutations and she was her father Long story short, her father was a Norskin, didn't was like, ah, didn't like the way she looked, and he sacrificed her to a sort of deity the Norskins know about in the ocean. So he chucked her into the ocean as an offering because he thought like she looks like a sea creature, so he gave her back, um, which she was very not happy with. But she was taken in by Manon. Uh, like the god Manon sent his servants, um, the mermaids, um, and like naiads and stuff. They grabbed her, they took her to an island where she was raised. And she was a she's considered the adopted daughter of Manon, and Manon likes her a lot. Um, she ends up escaping. Um, as and Manon plays a key role in that. Um, like Manon acts for how for I want y'all to understand how crazy the final battle of the Dreadfleet is. Manon himself gets involved, like a trident that is bigger than any of the ships comes piercing out of the ocean and skewers one of the ships. I think it actually skewers Count Noctilus' ship and holds it in place. Okay. Um, so like it's it's a bonkers story, Thanks, but um, yeah, uh, Ar Arnessa escapes and the the Golden Magus survives because he actually takes over the Galleon's graveyard afterwards. Nothing comes of that, but he's the one that takes it over. Literally nothing. Yeah, and it's revealed that he was a secret Zinch cultist the whole time, which was which I don't like yeah. at all. I, 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 it, go watch I'm my always amused video. at how much you and I agree yeah, yeah, yeah. on these things. It's, it's like it's oh, great, great, like, great. Then oh no, it's almost like if you read enough of the lore, you go that doesn't work with everything else we've established. Yes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the Golden Magus. That's why in my Airby video I talk about I hate the Zinch thing because it's only revealed at the very end and it doesn't make sense with a lot of his characterization before that. But anyway, yeah. Um, uh. Is the Maw truly horrific, or is he just hangry and wants to om nom nom things? No, it's a thinking entity. It's terrifying. Yep. Like, we, we've talked about that. It's very cool and stuff, but if you actually sit down and think about it, it is a horrific entity. Yeah, this is not an entity like an animal that eats. Um, an animal is just working for towards survival. This is an 
infinitely hungry god that wants to eat everything and will do whatever it needs to do. It is also extremely cunning. Not necessarily clever or intelligent, but cunning. And that is, if anything, even more horrific. Yeah, proper horrific entity that is happy for everything to just break down into blood and be poured down its gullet. Um, Mr. Grumbler, those are some awesome questions for Andy, but they're not really related, so I'm going to skip them just due to time. I would heavily recommend sending those questions to Andy on Twitter if you're watching. Um, I'm sure or alternatively, would... jump into my Discord channel. Head down yes, there. Yes, yes, yes. Join Andy's That's Discord. Good uh, go um, join my Discord channel. I, I take lots of questions over there, and I'm happy to discuss. Yeah, those are out. those are awesome questions. Go go check out and, uh, the Lawhammer Discord, uh, and uh, you can find Andy in there very easily. You'll probably find that there's actually a link to uh, my Discord in the YouTube side if you're on the YouTube side. So do check over on the YouTube links at the bottom. I'm pretty sure I put a just um, yeah. A and if Hawk there. Hawk, if you're here, if you could post those on Twitch as well, we would appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Um, Thank you, Hawk. You rock. Yes, you do. You and all your silly memes. Uh, Infiltrator <laughs> of Troy. How haphazard is the pilgrimage ogres make to the Maw? It is obscenely dangerous. Obs oh, yeah. I think it's like one in ten ogres makes it back. It, it's something like ridiculous like that. Yeah. Um, you're not only going through the very worst of environments, but getting there and standing on the lip of the Maw is exceedingly dangerous no other way of putting it yeah it's even and there's even some notes that some ogres like they make the journey and when they reach the end they full-on like have a moment where like they basically they're compelled to throw themselves in and they fail to resist that compulsion i can imagine the more itself is probably talking to some of them yeah probably like hey i'm hungry jump. get on in here <laughs> get in here come on just jump yeah, so. don't you don't you want to see? Don't you want to understand and be? Don't you want to know what down in? here? Come on, yeah. come and have a look. <laughs> we all it's time. We all eat down here. Uh, <laughs> um, or I, I think there's actually a really good um uh, analogy for this. Um, and I'm going to sound like I'm speaking mental here, but I'm going to drop it anyway. Oh, and you always Effect, sound like you're speaking mental. In Mass Effect <laughs> Two. In Mass Effect 2, completely different game, there's a character who warns you quite clearly, if you sleep with me, you will die. And almost everybody who reads that line gives it a go. <laughs> and dies and goes, oh, but I thought I was the primary character and I couldn't die as the death screen goes, dum, dum, dum. Up, and you're like, oh, shit. Reload time. Wow, but what, a perfect, it a, what a perfect stupid trap for humans that would almost yeah, always totally. If you fuck and, this thing, you're going to die. Oh, yeah, I, I, I have to see where this goes. <laughs> okay, have, so for example, sitting on the edge of the mall, there's like a dying creature just hanging over the lip. Oh, I could eat that. It's just sitting there, down there. You go over the edge, and down you go. Ah, caught by your own hungers, you stupid ogre. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I imagine that happens quite a bit. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, then reading the rest of this. Um, so yeah, and I will note that. Um, the the big thing for the maw is that the ogres go there because they feel a deep very compulsion and they understand it's exceedingly dangerous there's even a a place of preparation which is the hall of the lazargs so the tribe that groth one finger was a part of who made the original trek they basically set up and it's it's a shanty town like it is not a nice place because it's yeah. so it's it's considered the last bastion of preparation before you journey to the maw itself um, it's a deeply unpleasant place. The ogres there are very mutated because they're so close to a lot of like warpstone and warpstone dust. Um, the noblars there are in horrific condition, but they they're functionally like um, monks of the great maw. Like there are these very religious figures that do ceremonies of preparation for ogres that pass in and congratulate the ogres that make it back out. Um, and there's even uh, there's even a whole gimmick about how there are special rocks that are found there that ogres will take and sometimes take take out one of their eyes and eat it and pop I it in their eyes. Nice idea. Um, just it's a really small one. I'll just interrupt for a moment. Imagine you've got your monks and they're obviously super dedicated to the mob, but it's a really dangerous environment now. They may be largely resistant to chaos, but they're still mutating. I quite like the idea that the mutations are perceived to be almost gifts from the mob because you can chop them off and eat them because they're not part of you. Well, no, and that but yeah, that works like though that. with chaos ogres. Yeah. And that chaos ogres yeah. are welcomed back in the ogre kingdoms because they just see it as better ways to eat. Oh, you got a tentacle? Look, that's an extra arm you chop can eat. With. You got an extra. But even just keeping them, or like you yeah, yeah, yeah. another mouth, like the Lazars are like, 
the great maw gave me another mouth on my on my rib cage. Now I can eat through two mouths. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah, which is hilarious because like I don't think the great maw would even bother <laughs> gifting mutations. That's not I'm, really his mo. But I see the ogres but, being like, of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, totes. Zinc anyway. is sitting there like, but that I did that. The ogre's like, nah, nah, I'm not giving you credit. You're too, you're too smart. I don't like listening to your babbling. <laughs> Shut up, nerd. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, in uh, infiltrator of Troy. How intelligent and sane is the maw? We don't know. We have no I'd idea. Probably say the concept of sanity here would be ill used to try and define a ever hungry god. Uh, what winds of magic is the maw connected to? You could argue all of them, oh. but he's pri he's very heavily associated with the winds of uh, Shaish, Azir, Gar. and Gur. Gur, and Those there's are... going to be quite a lot of um, uh, Gyron running through as well. It's a living entity, um, so there's going to be a lot of that kicking yeah, about. Too. He is a also he... a god, so you're going to get a good bit of uh, Haish. In fact. The more you think about it, the more you can... I mean, it's, it's absolutely consumed with a single passion. Consumption, that's a zeer. Not a zeer, pardon me. That's actually... Um, you could ar make arguments for pretty much all the wins. It is, after all, a, an entity that comes from the skies. Oh, a zeer. Yeah, you can make arguments for them all. Yeah, and, and, and that's kind of part of the course. And that's, that, I think, correct. Answer. And the, yeah. all the wins are going to get be getting sucked into it anyway. Uh, okay, uh, uh, service the in. Bursting through these questions really quick. Uh, did the Great Maw affect slash devour any of the giant dragons sleeping underground? Almost, yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, do Noblars worship the Maw or Gork and Mork? Uh, they worship the Maw because they got they integrated do. into Ogre society. They're entirely integrated um, with their desperate desire not to be integrated into the Chaos Dwarf society. <laughs> yeah, there's actually that's actually a probably interesting thing of why you have never seen a Noblar shaman uh, because they interact with the Maw, not with the their patron god. Um, though there have actually been some really hilarious suggestions that there are super intelligent novelers out there, but that has to do with uh, just them being goblins functionally. Mm. Um, but, you yeah, know, um, which is actually really cool. There's there's a whole thing we could go into about Gork and Mork, which we'll have to do one day in that they're they're really interesting gods. Anyway, um, let's see. So, yes, were there things that were very big underground that Thanks Great so Mob may have accidentally ate? I would say yes, because Great Mob's going to be nom, nom, nom. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Could there be a story about an ever chosen trying to slay or enslave the Great Maw? Hell yes, there. Hell is. yeah! In fact, I think that would almost certainly be one of the ever chosen stories that I would choose if I was going to be filling up the gaps for the remaining. There's like thirteen of them. Yeah, like a, that could one also of them explain would like how the Challenge it. Stone initially came about, of like the mm. hordes of chaos coming down to the mountains of Morn, trying to fight their way to the Great Maw through the ogres. That would be fucking awesome. Great yeah, war. Yeah, a good deal in that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Gork and Mork versus the Great Maw. Here we go. Gods don't really do that, but it would be a mess because you'd have a mostly etheric entity fighting a mostly non-etheric entity. <laughs> like, they, they would have a hard time hitting each other. It kind of doesn't work. It'd be a little bit like a mountain trying to have a fight with a, a, a giant crevasse at the bottom of the, of the ocean. They're two very different things, and they don't really fight that way. Yeah, that being said, I do think the endless desire for violence of the Greenskins does have a lot of sympathy for the endless desire for hunger of the uh, Great Maw. There's mm -hmm. there's a reason Greenskins and Ogres tend to get along very well, even before yeah. Age of Sigmar directly tied them together. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think it's also <laughs> relatively clear that if you run by the way Games Workshops run it, that the Maw is physically tied to the Warhammer world and will die. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's actually very natural that the Grey Maw died with the, the rest of the Warhammer world and that Gorka Morka took up the role as like the great eater. Um, like they still yep. they still have that like great maw type relationship, but it's as Gorka Morka as a big god that eats anything he wants. Yeah, cut cut it down simply when the maw was removed from its physical components, it was a much smaller god and it was just absorbed. Yep. Uh, yes, the gulping god. Thank you. That's what he's called in AOS. The gulping god is right. how they refer to Gorka Morka. Uh, let's see. Do I reckon the Lizardmen would exterminate the Great Maw if they could? Hell yeah. That is not part of the Great Plan. They would be... Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> they would definitely start pouring some cement in there. <laughs> yeah, cut a long story short. It was almost certainly created by a Warpstone meteorite. That was not part of the Great Plan. Yep. Yeah, that's literally just chaos creating something. And if it doesn't matter if what was created afterwards was, you know, there's actually a really interesting thing a lot of people don't think about in that the Lizardmen would probably kill a lot of things people really love, like griffins, manacores, 
Uh, but like, even assuming like, they're not natural, I mean, there's there's a lot of arguments that they might be. Yeah, well, there's like a whole thing of Maybe like, you don't mind well, <laughs> I, I should refer, there are people within the world itself of Warhammer who believe cr griffins and hippogriffs were yep. created by chaos, not that they didn't exist before then. Whether or not that's true, we don't know. Um, but Indeed. if it was true, then the Lizardmen would actually be a pretty, they would actually be pretty nightmarish about trying to restore things to pre-chaos. Yeah, I think that one of the strongest arguments that they're not purely chaotic creatures is that the elves still use them. Yeah. Uh, let's see. If if Gelt were to be eaten by the Great Maw, do you think he'd just spin him back out because he's so repulsive? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, no, he'd just be eaten. <laughs> maybe, maybe he'd spit up his golden helmet and be like, ugh. <laughs> ugh. Anyway. Uh, Infiltrator of Troy, how does the Maw get food? Uh, through ritual, sacrifice, and things fall into it. And through every single ogre being summoned to it. All of them. Yeah, Don't forget also, that. Yeah, there's also a whole thing like ogre worship. Andy kind of talked about it earlier. Ogres have a very strict religion and that when they have feasts or, or they eat a meal, they're supposed to dig like a, a single ogre by himself. Nobody else around to judge him. Nothing like that. They will dig a little hole in the ground that kind of looks like a mouth and they'll take off a piece of what they're eating and chuck it in the hole because that is an offering to the mob. They don't eat that thing. That belongs to the mob. They eat the rest. Um, and when they have big feasts, there's a whole pit where they're like yep. chucking shit in. And they'll be they diving down in there and fighting as well. Um, yep. Because they are basically rolling around in rotten, horrible flesh because ogres, beating <laughs> living crap out of each other because ogres. And then the loser has to bite a bit off themselves and spit it out down into the pit. Oh, man. Yeah. And, like, um, <laughs> yeah. The, the maw, you have to remember, his stomach is very likely etheric. So it doesn't just eat physical matter. It also eats faith. Yep. In that sense, um, have there been any attempts to kill them all? Not that we know of, but I would not put it past Grand Cathay to have tried a few. Grand times. Cathay almost certainly have tried. I don't think there's any chance that they haven't. I think it's very likely that the kingdoms of Ind have done something ridiculous as well and almost certainly failed. Oh, uh, well, they yeah. have failed, um, but I, I can't imagine that that hasn't been attempted. Plus, I think Chaos has almost certainly tried to. Yeah, I yeah, I would agree with all those. Um, hell, I would I would even say that like initially after it kind of showed up, I would not have been shocked to find out the Sky Titans made an attempt as well. Yeah, uh, because it likely. was like the ancient giant lands, which were their home, were being mm -hmm. like obliterated by warpstone uh, yep. dust, which is what created the Yetis. For anyone curious, is that the ogres yep. that stayed in the ancient giant lands got mutated because of all the warpstone dust and turned into Yetis over generations, mm -hmm. which are a completely different culture. A lot of people think they're wild animals. They're not. They're very intelligent. They have a very unique culture. They have their own language. They just answer the call of the ogres because of ancient packs, which is fascinating. And Yetis are criminally unexplored, and it makes me sad. That makes me sad too. Um, and their models are really old and really ugly. <laughs> um, I, I can't wait for the their redesign for Total War. So excited for when we get the Yetis. Uh, let's see. Do the Chaos Ogres worship the Maw in addition to the Chaos Gods? Most do. Uh, yeah, I it, think is, so. it, it is said that there are occasional Ogres that will give up worship of the Maw and worship only a single Chaos God, but they are considered far more rare than the yeah, alternative. I'm you got to remember, this is um, even when we're dealing with creatures that are so far away from, say, the Empire. This is a polytheistic society. The ogres themselves have multiple gods. The idea of worshipping gods that are sensible in the circumstances you're in still prevails. Um, and the ogres are eternally and almost intrinsically linked to the maw, whether they're sitting at the gates themselves staring into the great eternity of that warp gate or whether they're trying to swim their way down to the southern mall it, they're still connected to it so i think that uh, it's not just that they have given up on the mall the mall is just there it's not so much that it's worship per se as it's just a part of their life no matter what choices they make yeah and kind of when you think about the fire mouth as well it's probably would not be surprising that many ogres would conflate some aspects of the chaos gods with the mall and just be like oh this is obviously something that is a child of the mall or is like a brother or a sister to the maw. So like, of course I can worship it. It's not a big deal. And ogres are very, they're very accepting. It, they're hilariously accepting. Like chaos ogres who have mutated and are like even worshiping another God will still go home to the mountains of Morn. They'll still visit their tribes, 
and they'll come yeah. tell stories and the other ogres will be like you're a little weird now but all right whatever <laughs> one one piece of lore that's worth driving down relatively heavily on is that there is a strong feeling that if you're mutated any mutation at all your soul is now damned whether you wish it to be the case or not you've lost yourself to the dark gods um and that's one way that you could arguably say that they would lose their connections to the moth because the mutation begins to take over their mind loses any uh, connection to whatever it had on the outside you could argue that but i think it is broadly speaking much more complicated and individual um every individual be dealt with in their own way it is worth saying though that if that is true and if a uh, mutation results in corruption effectively that the maw arguably would look to bring them back home to eat them yeah because no, they're uh, no longer going to be doing what the maw wants so just eat them eat them yeah i will say uh there's like there's a full passage in the eighth edition ogre kingdoms book about chaos ogres and like ogres i will not brook a disagreement on this from anyone they are the most accepting culture in warhammer fantasy yeah totally they welcome they're, they're, everyone with open arms they welcome everyone and they will also go to everyone and attempt to fit in too ogres are pretty cool in that regard yeah like chaos ogres come home and like there's even a note about chaos or ogres that are full-on like we're talking fanatical worshipers of nurgle zinch whatever and other ogres like they welcome them home and they're like yeah. i don't know what you're talking about it sounds kind of weird but <laughs> awesome just want to say i really <laughs> like the community you guys have created lord dumps you do i didn't know about warhammer until total war and i really love the passion people have thanks for teaching well thank you we really appreciate it it's very sweet yeah they really appreciate that thanks i was some lion saurus i almost said your name wrong <laughs> <laughs> almost <laughs> um uh, Akuma King, do ogres have the equivalent to frat boy parties where they visit slash crash land at the Galleon's graveyard and bug Noctilus? Would Count Noctilus be able to hire ogre mercenaries for his crew this way? So that particular image, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I, we talked about earlier, I feel that it would be almost undeniable that the ogres would be able to find a way into the Galleon's graveyard and set up some kind of cult around the maelstrom itself. I think Noctilus would treat with them. Absolutely. He treats with everyone in the Galleon's graveyard. Everyone. And, and, the, and the ogres as a species are really quite accepting. You'd probably find them strapping on bones, putting skull masks on, wandering around pretending that they're undead, really being happy with the whole situation as it stands. So, yeah, I think that that could be... I a mean, honestly, problem. Noctilus could offer them a hell of a deal of being like, I will take you to the most wild places in the world. You'll get to go everywhere. Serve, They'd love it. Yeah, serve on yeah. my crew and like i'll bring you back and you yeah. like and even if you die i'll bring you back <laughs> like he'd have a hell of a bargain with them yeah noctilus is uh in terms of a character much like the dark elves clever enough to realize that the best way to deal with ogres is to treat with them if you try to enslave them or push your will upon them they fight back hard and they have very strong wills yep um okay we've already answered all of these um should the uh, Infiltrator Troy, I, I will just briefly answer this. Of Should the ogres get a unique building, building with the Galleon's Graveyard until World Warhammer? I think they should. Yeah, I think they should have a unique interaction with the Galleon's Graveyard like uh, the Vampire Coast does. I also think the Vampire Counts should get a unique interaction with it as well. Um, and maybe the Tomb Kings? I'd have to think on that one a little bit. But I, yeah, I absolutely think the ogres should get a unique structure um, instead of just the level one thing everybody else gets. Um, let's see uh arthur the seventh julius pendragon that's a long name but awesome name uh i know it sounds awesome and seems lore plausible but is there canon evidence for the connection of the maelstrom to the great Maw? yeah it's it is yeah. deliberately stated it's, it's, flat it's stated, stated in multiple places as well both the ogre kingdom's army lists state it for uh for certain and they one of them even does it in a in an almost objective voice so not a voice that's in in cartridge. these are connected there we go. Next. Yeah. And so, the yeah. Graveyard points, or the Dreadfleet points it out as well. Yeah. It, it's a thing. It, it's definitely a thing. Dreadfleet uh, marks that. Yeah. I remember it marks out directly too. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, as the uh, secondary second bout of insane. Oh my God. The way you write your name where it's alternating caps and lower caps. So it's actually uh, really hard to read. That's uh, just cruel. <laughs> second bout of insanity. Thank you. Uh, as the Maw is a creation of warp zones, solidified essence of chaos. Does that mean it's a chaos deity? No. Uh, no. chaos is a really stupidly used term in warhammer a lot of the time and it's mostly due to authors that conflate magic with chaos or the ether with chaos where chaos is more of a subset that belongs to a specific group of gods 
Um, and th it also doesn't help that there are a lot of people within the world with really good writers, but because it's written from an in-universe perspective, they believe everything is chaos because of the way they understand things, which causes a lot of confusion, but they're not necessarily the same. It does. Um, bluntly, no. Uh, I'm going to skip that because we answered it. Um... Uh, second bout of insanity. Do the me does the meteoric warp stone origin of the Maw mean it has any connection with Morslib or Debad Moon? Does that mean there might be a, a unique uh, way that the Beastmen and Night Goblins might feel about it? Uh, that could be an interesting thing to explore. I, I do I think mean, Beastmen would have some interesting thoughts on the Maw. Yeah, I, I think so too. And I think there's a lot there that could potentially be used, but I think you would start um, eroding at many of the individualities, at the individual traits, pardon me, of the different species. Um, so uh, something for individuals rather than uh, general commentary. Yeah. That being said, I will tell you in Spooky Month, I don't know what week, might be this week's vote, might be a future week's vote. I am going to get the Chaos Moon as one of the options. Um, that would be a bonkers episode y'all have no idea how fucking crazy more is it's um, it's a it's a it's it's a thing yeah I, i'm gonna feel bad who whoever we put up against it because i feel like it's gonna be a absolute smash but uh let's see uh blah, 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 blah. um well, uh, von raptor oh. all the moons yeah all the said, moons. No, yep. bring up all the moons uh, uh, von raptor do you believe the maelstrom and the mar connect yes i i do believe they're 100 percent the same thing i i don't yeah. believe that it's superstition i think it is undeniable that they're the same thing and that's an it's intended that they're the same thing yes it is definitely intended there's no doubt about it the map that was released that we mentioned earlier in the stream um expressly calls it out as well and it was released exactly the same time as the ogre kingdom's army list as well it was always the yeah they, idea. they were designed together mm -hmm. um in the warhammer 2 epilogue for count noctilus vortex he intends to use the maelstrom to sail the time stream to eliminate his threats and not uh rivals who other than noctilus do you think would be able to use the maelstrom to sell the time stream to what ends well so it goes into the ether right and if you're using the ether laws of reality literally do not apply to you yeah uh, and honestly, Noctilus, especially with his mastery of like shadows and then his mastery of Shaiish through the Maelstrom, he could fucking absolutely sail through time. It would be hard. There'd have to be a big ritual, but he could do it. Yeah, I, uh, that, that's something that I've even used as a plot point in my games. Um, if you are a master of certain winds um, and you can also access the Aether sometimes, that means that there is a possibility of being able to be in a different time. Um, so, for example, Knights of Zinch may have originally been born in a previous version in a, in a later pardon me incursion of chaos and they actually go to war three incursions earlier um because time mm -hmm. itself can be played differently in the eternal city yeah i mean hell athel lauren time is super fucking funky in athel lauren like people yeah. have gone into athel lauren and run into themselves <laughs> from a different time and been like hey it's me like, like uh, that actually happens in the uh, the elf omnibus. There's a story that follows a Bretonian character. He literally runs into himself as a Grail Knight. Like yep. he's a normal guy. He runs into a badass Grail Knight. It's actually him. And when he's later a Grail Knight, he runs into his younger self, and he's like, "Oh, I remember this. Um, it's yeah. weird." <laughs> um, but magic, magic be weird. Um, let's see. We've already talked about that. Uh, we've already talked about that. Um. Uh, the, uh, uh, we've talked about that theory. Yep, that with the Great Maw being with Zhao Ming's psyche, it could be that Noctilus has a similar relationship with the Maelstrom. Yeah. I think that's a good 100%. theory. Good. Yep. I like um, that. Uh, no, we've talked about gods don't work that way. As far as if the ogre suddenly vanished, the Great Maw would not also just vanish. It would change, but it would not just suddenly vanish. Especially because it's like an actual creature. Um, it would, if anything, it's more resistant to change like that than any other god. I think it'd be a really interesting story where it started giving birth. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know. <laughs> ah, funny you say that. The next question, <laughs> Malasar puts on tinfoil hat. Is the Maw a Tyranid that cannot reproduce? Psychic control over the ogres demands biomass. Seems like a Tyranid life form experiment. It even ate a part of the planet. So I will say, I don't like when my 40k touches my fantasy. I like to keep them very far away from each other. However, the idea that the mom might be an alien is not without merit. Yeah, I mean, it would uh, totally work. Big Squiddy, it would, um, to a degree, make sense. I would argue, though, that the existing uh, description for what it is, which is an, 
a manifestation of everything that was slaughtered when Warpstone hit it makes more sense. Yeah, I, I think it would make it a lot more boring. Sense. Um, yeah. That being said, if you're a hardcore 40k fanboy and you're writing and you're doing like Warhammer Fantasy roleplay um, stuff, let's just discuss this for a moment. Uh, quick head ticker video. So I think we maybe over the course of the stream, if we were super lucky, might have hit 3,000 subs on oh, Longhammer yeah, YouTube. Uh, you should go check. If I'm when we check. hit 5,000 subs on Lawhammer, the YouTube channel, okay. I will. Okay, yeah. We, we did awesome. So we are yeah. less than 2,000 subs to go. I will release the Queek video. And I actually Ooh. have a really funny question regarding it that I'm going to have Andy help me with uh, that Ooh. I'm not going to say here because I don't want to spoil it. Um, but um, I'm well up for that. Yeah, there's there's something really... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask him to do something really stupid. <laughs> It'll be great. <laughs> and I know he's going to do yeah. it. That's the best part. <laughs> But uh, anyway, um, but yeah, if you're playing a Wolfram campaign and you want to go crazy with like the Warhammer Fantasy World is just a planet somewhere in the 40k universe, which if you want to all the power to you and you want the Great Maw to literally just be a giant Tyranid, go for it. You can make that work. I, I, I would not. That's not what I would suggest for Warhammer Fantasy itself. I think it reduces the Great Maw in a lot of ways. But if you really want to connect the universes, it can work. Yeah, it could work. It wouldn't be my preference. And I have indeed played games where 4K and Warhammer are connected deep. And that isn't the choice I would have made if I was doing that. I Share have the channel choice. link. Bitch, you are in his YouTube chat. chat. You are, <laughs> you are on literally the channel. in my chat right now. So no. Subscribe to this channel right it's now. It's literally just this channel. <laughs> <laughs> can you give me the link you're already here <laughs> can you assuming we to the building you there? i'm already in <laughs> christ uh, oh nice. uh, sorry triple herbals i didn't mean to make fun of you I, that happens to me i just click on a link to watch a stream and don't even realize where i am but th please subscribe thank you <laughs> i'm sorry that was mean i shouldn't have said that um um have we considered doing uh okay that's uh that's a different uh, I will look at, I have no idea who that person is. I will look into that grumbler. Thank you though. Um, are the great maw and Zhao Ming BFFs? I would, based on how Zhao Ming reacts to it, I would say no, no. Uh, how does the great maw feel about the fire mouth? I would argue that it probably just sees it as another way to consume. So it probably likes it in a sense. That's a really interesting question. Yeah, See, my that... first thought was it doesn't care. It literally doesn't care. It just consumes, 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 and that's private. But we know that it's sentient, I which think it means thinks so it much. does have drives. Yeah, and it's it. Uh, that's something I would actually like to reflect on. I think could make for a really good story. Yeah, fu the funny thing, by the way, for anyone curious, the funniest thing about the fire mouth is the big thing that it introduced to ogre culture was not necessarily like a new religion or a new god. It introduced the idea that they should cook all of their meat, which is what made it so popular as a god. <laughs> because the ogres were like oh wow this tastes a lot better <laughs> super silly um but ogres um is it possible to enter the mall and then climb out possible yes but uh i don't we've talked about how horrifying just like the hundreds of miles of the warpstone desert is to get to the great mall there are firestorms there are things living in it that are like indescribably horrible yep. and that's before you get to the mall which is a living entity that wants to eat you it is possible in the same way that it is possible that technically, according to quantum physics, I could push my hand against something and there's a one billionth percent chance that I could go through it. Um, so think of it that way. Um, how many more do these do? Okay, we're almost done. Um, let's see. Uh, any Have any non-ogres made to the maw aside from sacrifices? Not that I've... Probably, but not that I'm I mean, like. There's going to be all sorts, clearly. But yeah, some, uh, some human okay, academic, right. almost surely. Yeah, has. Sure. I wouldn't be surprised if an elf made the journey too. Um, elves are big nerds like that. Um, I want to bring this one up, even though um, I don't think it's at all accurate. I think it's far too cartoony and small, because that's the nature of how graphics are presented. <laughs> yeah, think of it as a representation, not uh, like. Yeah, I think yeah. it's a lovely representation of what it could be, but um, we are looking at something that is vast. And it's it's rimmed. Uh, it, that doesn't yeah. look vast. It looks especially, almost Sarlacc, Sarlacc pit from Star Wars in terms of its yeah. rules. Well, yeah, well, especially considering like they have to try and present it from a purely top down perspective, and yeah. it, they also it's not interactable. So like like it looks cool, but if anything gets in the way of the gameplay, like they wanted a representation, that's what they did. Yeah, exactly. Um, since Grimgore, uh, Avipex stream. Since Grimgore conquers the Ogre Kingdoms in the end times. 
he had to have gone towards the great mall what does he think of it we don't know it, they didn't they didn't bother with any of that shit oh man um, I, I, I really i mean if that if it had gone down the way you'd expect i'd almost half expect the maw to move to lift to eat him it, it would have been oh so many things that could have happened but no it didn't yeah the, the you have to we said it kind of before the great mob plays zero impact yeah. in the end times like the ogres they also yeah. play zero impact which is a fucking huge shame um it should have been involved like the maw should have like andy said the maw should have probably started to walk or like get up somehow it should have been horrifying like the ground cracking open is maybe some like it's a like, giant leech crop. like just yeah. imagine like a big tunnel like worm made of flesh and teeth rising out or of the perhaps earth. it's responsible for destroying the ogre kingdoms in large parts of cathay because it just realizes that the end is coming and in its death throes it just eats everything and it pretty yep. much creates a hole that sucks everything down there um and it's entirely self-motivated and nothing else until eventually there's nothing left planet gone um there's all manner of things they could have written but they didn't yeah, so the answer is, eh. yeah. uh, that being said, I, I do think greenskins would just kind of, it would depend on the type of greenskins. A lot of greenskins would not want to deal with the mod because they'd be scared of it, but some greenskins would probably look at it as a very wonderful thing to fight because of how big it is. And greenskins are idiots. Yeah. <laughs> um, and violence yeah. is like the number one thing they think about. Uh, I think an entity like Grimgore, Grimgore is very clever. A lot of people don't realize how fucking deviously smart he is. Um, like he's not just cunning he's fucking smart um i think grimgore would look at it and try and evaluate if he could reasonably kill it and if he couldn't he would just piss off because all he wants to do is fight and he would look at it and be like it's probably not going to fight back i'm i'm out um did the great mod do anything in relation no we already answered that uh did the old ogre gods get eaten by the great maw I that think that's a very good question. one and i think that's um i i think that's a brilliant question i think it's quite likely um, because it uh, speaks to the entire psychology for how the ogres work and how the Great Maul works. And part of it becoming the god that it becomes would almost certainly involve consumption, suggesting that the whatever deities may or may not have been there were consumed during that initial impact. So, yeah, I think that's very likely. Uh, let's see. Would it be possible to seal the Great Maul or to cast it fully into the ether? Uh, what you're going to seal it with, it'll just eat it. Yeah, uh, it would uh, like you do mention the lizardmen at their peak with the first generation slon. Maybe they could have cast it into the ether, but that it would be like like we're talking like <laughs> maybe I don't know. Uh, like first generation slon are so stupid that they literally almost break reality when they do things. So like theoretically, I guess they could, but at the same time, it's such a ridiculous amount of just stuff. Yeah, it's 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 an immovable force hitting that yeah. another say, immovable force. It's yeah, just I would say like could the old ones have dealt with it? Probably. But the old ones also are like literally taking the concept of magic to realms so beyond absurdity it's not even funny. But it's also worth saying though that the old ones themselves couldn't cope with the dragons. They didn't cope with the dragons. They put other forces out to deal with it and send them out. They couldn't cope with the uh dragon ogres. There are the <laughs> old ones are at the peak. But at the same point, what was already in the world was something that they had to cleanse and they sent things out to cleanse. And that was going for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years. So it's not as simple as saying it would be done. I don't think it would be. I think everything is much more complex than some people would prefer because it's very easy to say Smackdown because my thing's best. Eh, but then the yeah. other thing is not something that unexpectedly you wriggles up. What probably would have happened would have been a lot of really interesting conflicts of them trying to destroy them all, which would have had different ramifications. And then they probably would have sealed it away, but not in the sense of putting a cover over mm. it, but trying to cordon around it, which also probably would have Starve led it. To, yeah, which would have also led to problems, inevitably. But then um, it's it's as theoretical questions go, it's as theoretical as they come because it only exists because <clears> of the ogres, which oh, in turn here, here's a great, the yeah, old one. Here's a Here's a really cool question because I think about this one. I love it. As Slanesh is all about excess and has the major um, aspect of gluttony, wouldn't Slanesh be incredibly fond of the Great Maw? Or since it's always hungry and not necessarily overeating, would they instead stand opposed? Right. So um, first, gluttony and Slanesh is a careful line you must walk. Slanesh is all about excess 
doing something and it not being enough. So going on to the next thing and the next thing and becoming jaded. There's a reason that jade scepters, for example, are a classic symbol of um, Slanesh in various backgrounds, um, where the um, maw is all about that one thing and never being satiated. They are I would I would argue they're actually opposing in terms of their overall beliefs. One is much more cerebral than the other. The other one is pure instinct and can't be perverted, cannot be corrupted, cannot be changed, never gets bored. The fact it never gets bored of eating means that it can never be corrupted by Slanesh, and Slanesh would hate it, absolutely despise it, because it can never reach the point where Slanesh can set its little fingers in and corrupt it into a different mindset um it's incorruptible in that regard because it can never be satiated that being the case i would say that contrary to the initial expectation i would say they're deeply deeply opposed but only from the slanesh side the mall i don't think would care yeah what's what's interesting about slanesh when you think about the gluttony aspect particularly is i think a lot of people hammond, <laughs> hammond why do you do this to us man <laughs> non-ogres <laughs> get out <laughs> We love you, but get out. <laughs> oh, man. So uh, what's interesting about Slanesh from that perspective is that when Slanesh, when you see Slanesh gluttony, I think done well, it's not necessarily about like eating until you explode without care. It's more about an endless pursuit of trying to eat everything exotic, of trying to find the next best thing or the next thing no one's tried before. It's a tier system that never ends, which turns it into a hell. <laughs> Like, um, and and worse, a tier system that has a potential end, and it's where corruption lies, because Slanesh then says, I can give you something more. I can give you something more. Yeah. Um, and that's where the corruption seeps in, where with the mall, no, it doesn't care. Just keep on like, throwing Ludo's, the shit in. Um, in Age of Sigmar, we finally mm -hmm. got a special character dedicated to the gluttony aspect of Slanesh, which is Gludos Arskelion. And his whole deal is that he's like he's got his big pavilion, he's got all his servants that are like feeding him, and he's all fat and stuff. Like he's a gluttonous individual, but for him, it's not about eating the same thing over and over. He hates that. He mm. wants something different, something exotic and fresh. So he's like, oh, I hear there's this strange creature. I've never tasted its flesh before. Take me there. And that that's his whole deal is constantly expanding his palate, not just eating for the sake of eating. Yep. And I think, yeah, so I would say that's where their difference lies. And, and it's kind of like how... In a lot of ways, Slanesh kind of likes Nagash because he's kind of this ultimate expression of arrogance and pride. But Nagash doesn't take the type of enjoyment. Nagash ruins it because he doesn't celebrate himself. He doesn't. He has this kind of almost cold arrogance of that of control versus he wants to be worshipped actively. Um, Nagash has a very there's a really cool line in the marks of omen where Nagash is building up in second edition he's about to like try and kill everybody and do this whole thing where at first Slanesh is all for it like Slanesh of all the gods that start getting like premonitions and being like oh shit Nagash is about to do his thing Slanesh is the only one that at first is like yeah get it Nagash yeah get it but then he starts to think a little bit and he goes wait there's gonna be no celebration there will be no parades there will be no parties. He's not going to exult in his victory. He's just going to sit there quiet over an endless domain of death and be and just be. But he's not going to enjoy it. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> then Slanesh goes against the gash. Um, it, it, I think it's it's similar to that. Though I don't think the mob particularly enjoys necessarily the aspect of eating. It simply eats. Yeah um yeah uh let's see uh if the bot only hungers why is it and by extension ogre so fixated on meat and not foliage so why does it focus on meat more than anything else uh i think a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's not it's it's kind of mm, it's ogre physiology yeah um, that would be the best uh, way ogres are bro broadly speaking carnivores and in turn the moa is also yeah and like they're there are notes ogres will eat other weird things. There are ogres, ogres that eat, eat anything. Yeah, there are um, ogres that eat rock. There are ogres that eat metal. Yeah. There are ogres that kind of need to indeed because that's part of how their stum their stomachs are constantly churning. They when you pass an ogre, you hear them. The, the their bellies are grinding. It's made of solid muscle, huge, massive bellies grinding away. They can deafen um, people if they get too close, particularly if they're also hungry. Yeah, but they, they do that eat. as they're digesting. They have multiple stomachs in there, all doing different jobs. Yeah, they're they're noisy. 
Yeah, um, and they, they literally eat rocks and metal as part of their digestive that's process. Part of the digestive process, totally. Yeah, but meat to them is the most important. Also, like if you're thinking of it from like a, almost a scientific thing, if you're looking for like the most calorie heavy t uh, stuff, uh, like naturally occurring in the world, like in efficient in conversion of energy, you want meat. Yeah, uh, and ogres need a lot of food. Uh, let's see. Uh, we already talked about chaos ogres. Uh, what would? <laughs> What is this question? What would happen if the Skaven had thrown Nagash into the Great Maw with the fell blade in him? <laughs> he would have eaten him. Well, like, that's not eaten then. Guys, the fell blade is a really strong weapon. It cannot kill the Great Maw. It's a powerful weapon, but the Maw is too big. He's, he's just too big. And he's already a god. Like, if Nagash had been a god, I don't think it would have been as effective as it ended up being. Nagash was on, like, kind of that level of being godlike but he was not a god he was a very distinctly physical entity yep agreed um is the fire mouth truly the son of the the, the mob in their belief system yes which yeah has but is it actually no the, the mob didn't spit if you're asking about it's physically out, yeah. no absolutely not no. the mob did not spit out the fire mouth the, um, the most likely the most likely explanation as we currently have it is that it was an existing ogre deity that has had a new uh, belief system placed upon it um, and is one of the only ones that survived the Great Maw because it itself is an entity that matches very closely to the Great Maw's ideals. Yeah, I would say I would say you can the best way I can describe it based on the lore we have about it, it is functionally the ogre's sun god, what was left of it after the Great Maw and managed to survive because it was reinterpreted in a sense that synergized with the Great Maw. Or alternatively, it was just already a, a god of that particular mountain, and the Maw would literally have to eat that mountain for them to believe that that god was gone. And yeah. didn't, were all the other gods, because they were somewhat more ephemeral, they're just the god of whatever, the sky or whatever. Um, they were easily eaten and gone, because the Maw's eaten them. Uh, Snatter, is the Great Maw the most powerful material god? Probably, only because he's, he's already there. I would argue no, um, because there's a lot of material gods out there, contrary to popular expectation. I would say that, however, it is most certainly the most obvious and known <laughs> material god, um, and is, of all the material gods, probably the hardest to kill. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, powerful is always kind of a very vague... It is because it's power suggests. Like, what, that do you're going by, to be able what do you mean by to, power? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You've got to be able to lever things for power. Power is definitely the largest <laughs> in politics. Yeah. Power is often about politics, and it doesn't really have any politics beyond eating shit. Although we have determined already that it is the perfect manifestation of capitalism. Yeah. Is there anything the maw cannot consume? Um, hmm. I would say almost certainly um, uh, concepts, things that lie beyond ogre comprehension, the idea of joy, the idea of stuff, it's just beyond it. It consumes material things, so anything you chuck down there is going to be consumed. Um, so if it's material, not really. If it's immaterial, that's completely different. Aren't volcanoes like the opposite of consumption? Not from an ogre's point of view. An ogre's point of view, everything you throw into the volcano is eaten by lava. They're like, of course, totally. it's the ultimate eater. You have to remember, mm -hmm. it's from an ogre's understanding, not not ours with our science and deeper thought and whatever. Ogres don't bother with that. They tend to have a very surface level focus on things. Does it look like it's eating? Like, ogres would worship a black hole because they're like, oh, it's eating, obviously. <laughs> um, all right. So that is all the questions. We're Excellent. done. Um, that wow. timed out well. Um, there's I, I see a lot of kind of goofy questions sort of jumping up in the... Uh, the chats of stuff but uh we we appreciate everyone participating i'm just kind of looking if anything else jumps out of me like we, we kind of talked about the chaos gods earlier i think honestly the mall would seek to eat them but i don't think it necessarily i don't think it could without a yeah. drastic evolution because they something. are bluntly speaking conceptual entities that lie yeah. in the aether and it's not really into that sort of thing it's a material god so um uh my conclusion point is the maw is not really like anything else is it and it's a uh, other end is equally not like the other end you even though those two parts of the maw uh the manifestations in the material plane and um, look and act in similar ways they are very different in terms of how they're used and i think that that's um a fascinating aspect of what the mall represents for everyone right. so i'm also going to end with a please make sure you press wait, subscribe wait. We, have, oh, we, oh, oh, thing. we promised we promised oh no you're right we did promise that play uh, the video I, just, I i posted it in the chat i don't know if you can bring it can we bring it up on the screen 
or I think I could probably bring it up on a screen, perhaps. Like, where is it in the chat? Uh, let that. me just see. Um, that's it. There. Or you know what? I'll send it to you on Discord. That'll be easier. That's okay. I've got it up here. Let me see if I can pull okay. that down here. Oh, do not play. I was not ready for you to play. I'm not sure we'll get the sounds unless I. I mean, let me just see if I can share the screen. Uh, no, we can make it full screen. It's very. It's not that long. It's quite short. Okay, I need to present it as uh, extra camera video. Nope, I want oh, to share. Oh, because screen. we promised. Um, I need to share the entire screen with system audio. Okay, I have no idea how well this is going to turn out. So let's find out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, having not done this before, this will be exciting. Let's see if we can bring it up first. Oh, 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 we can. I'm going to call that a success already. Yeah, looks good. Um, and can I press, can I press play? Can yeah, you hear that? I can hear it. So here we Winning! go. Here we go. It's so gross but awesome. <laughs> Sacrifice you. <laughs> Chad, I know y'all couldn't hear it well. It's fine. Andy could hear it well. That was the point. I wanted his reaction to it. Uh, I apologize if you couldn't hear that one. Was there no volume at all for the um, stream? They're fine. Through? They could watch it themselves. They'll live. But, okay. Uh, I, I do apologize for that. That was hilarious. Um, but I will see because I can't help but say it. According to the lore, that would never happen. Well, the lore <laughs> sucks in that instance because I think ogres singing while they eat is hilarious. <laughs> I agree. I it was awesome. Um, so, yeah, maybe the sound was just low on this side. Let's have a quick look. Uh, oh, the sound was super low. I could have changed that. I apologize. Um, right. Live, so, click, subscribe, like, do all yes. those things. Uh, yeah, just a couple of uh, little things coming up. Uh, the next vote is going to be on Andy's channel, but and it then we'll, we'll have it over on uh, my channel for the next stream. Um, it will be continuing our spooky theme, so we will have our uh, spooky choices for yep. you on our uh, next one. And the week after that, we're going to have Gav Thorpe on. Yeah, so the 15th of October is going to be a very, very special episode where we're going to have Gav Thorpe. It's going to be awesome. We're going to talk a lot about lore, a lot of dwarfs, a lot of elves. It's going to get it's going to get wild. Um, mm. Also, uh, check out Lawhammer this Friday at the usual time at 1 yep. p.m. CST or 7 p.m. BST. Well oh. done. Um, <laughs> and uh, that is on the Twitch channel. So that is on it's the Lawhammer Twitch channel only. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to watch the episodes, they come out on the following Mondays, usually. They um, do. We please check that out. It. Indeed, it's... after this, I've got a bunch of maps that I need to sort out because our <laughs> map comes down just now. So I need to try and make it work for the YouTube video. Everything everything over there is just exploding all it's the time. Exploding. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, there is, it's a fantastic series. I cannot recommend it enough. I was literally introducing some people to it this weekend, and they all were having a great time with it. Uh, the most recent episode was fucking horrific. It was awesome. It was Whoa. mostly sad. It, it was that type of horror where it's more just sad. Um, it's it's great. It's it's an awesome series. Uh, it helps explore a lot of things in the Warhammer world. Not everything in it is what I would necessarily call canon, but there are a lot of really interesting ideas that are explored. Um, it also will help you appreciate why magic is something that most people don't want to fuck with because even in its most controlled forms, it's really dangerous and really unpleasant. Um, Although interestingly, so far there's nothing that wasn't already agreed with gw yes but i haven't seen it in a book so you can <laughs> that's, that's why i say so far because it's gonna go <laughs> skating wildly off into areas where i uh, never took out yet <laughs> yeah so uh really really please go check it out it's all on his youtube channel if you want to check out the prior episodes which i highly recommend and hopefully he'll be doing some write-up soon about the stuff that happened before the stream started mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. which uh that will be really exciting 
and um some other little and just just as teasers for y'all like there are there are stuff involving shaggots malekith the witch king uh how the larlorn elves are very unique from the other forms of elves what yeah, makes the wood yeah. elves so like kind of freaky to a lot of different elves um you've got halflings showing up there are uh there have uh, they've seen some ogres um there's been stuff involving a lot of gods uh a lot of gods who unfortunately didn't get as much attention as they should have um in the later editions of warhammer uh, a lot of beastman stuff a lot of mutant stuff um mm -hmm. approaching a lot of the hard conversations about mutants um mm. a lot of other special characters have been making appearances even magnus the pious sort of makes an appearance yeah magnus the pious <laughs> techless drunk techless really? <laughs> yeah drunk yeah. techless is great techless. <laughs> uh thankful uh won't thankful. say when but thankful shows up it's awesome uh but yeah please check it out and uh also rookery on saturdays rookery publications you can find them on youtube and twitch as well under that name and uh, they do phenomenal interviews. They just did an interview. I cannot remember his name, but I watched it. Um, they did an interview with the. Uh, you were sick. What, what was his? What was his name? I wasn't there. <laughs> I was lying at home going. Oh. It was a great episode about a guy I, who wrote a book about the uh, the origin of RPG systems and the history of RPGs and really breaking down oh, a lot yeah, of really that famous was games. Oh, yeah, Harvarth. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, Steve. it's it's um, a really interesting good. stream. Um, but they've done streams with like Black Library authors, people who've created a lot of like the Warhammer games and other mm -hmm. side games. Um, they've had uh, Andy Hall's been on talking about some Total War stuff as well as like Blood Bowl and some other really funny things. It's so funny to me that he worked on Blood Bowl. It's like, of course he did. But uh... yeah, of course he did. Um, I'm also going to interrupt and say that um, because we're on my channel this week, many of you may not have already subscribed to good old Lore Master of Sotek over there. And if that's the case, get over to his YouTube channels, get over to his Twitch channels and do so because mm -hmm. this sort of lore dump is pretty much his grist. He dives into all manner of cool and interesting interesting backgrounds for many of the characters including if we reach on the lawhammer side 5k quick head taker um subscribers over on youtube uh <laughs> that you will find fascinating he also streams uh warhammer games through the wazoo and he has many interviews as well with many of the creators of warhammer so if yet if you've yet to check them out go check them out now yeah, appreciate it. And now that we're done flating each other, uh, we can yep. get out of here. And I mean, uh, are we ever done with that? Who is, do you know who is on Rookery this Saturday? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'd be prepared, but I am not. Yeah. But it's going to be awesome this Saturday at 7 p.m. UK time. Yeah, there you go. But uh, thank you all again so much for watching. Hope you all have a lovely day. Uh, really appreciate uh, the quick video will be on my channel when Andy's. I know it's confusing. I incentive system deal with it when andy's <laughs> youtube channel the Lawhammer youtube channel reaches 5,000 subs on my youtube channel the quick head taker video comes out but if you're new to my channel there's a ton of other characters uh there's like a belagar iron hammer video that's like three hours long and archaeon set the imperishable a bunch of other characters mm -hmm. um so anyway, of cool. go do it yeah that is us done thank you all so much for watching we're gonna go figure out what the hell the votes are gonna be for next Indeed. week and we shall see you next time all right bye